All right, thank you, everyone. Um, so this is our last plenary um, on wealth, politics, and the political economy of monetary policy. Get started. Um, and so today's panel will start with Jamie Galbraith on uh, the reaction function, monetary policy, inflation, unemployment, and inequality, and presidential politics. Then we'll move to in-person group uh, with Jerry Epstein and Aaron Medlin on Federal Reserve Anti-Inflationary Policy Protection for the 1%. And then uh, finally will be Gregor, whose last name I should know how to pronounce because we went to grad school together, Gregor Semenyuk. Close enough. Um, on who profits from energy price inflation in the United States, followed by Michael Ash's discussant. Um, this panel is a little bit shorter than the other panel, so I'm going to have to be a really tight timekeeper. Um, I apologize in advance. Um, but with that, I will hand it off to you, Jamie, and I'll have to just verbally interrupt you once we're getting close to the end. Okay, thank you very much. And it's a pleasure to be with you, although not in person. But on the other hand, it's 71 degrees here. So there are some consolations. Uh, this is a paper that was actually written and uh, uh, initially posted on our website in 2007. Uh, so uh, it raises a question of why, why bringing it up now. Uh, the answer is that this paper analyzes the interest rate policies of the Federal Open Market Committee for quite a long period, 1969 to 2006. Um, it covers the last major inflationary episode in modern U.S. history, 69 to 83, and its aftermath from 84 to 2006. It was submitted to R.E. Stat and rejected for les majeste, which is the crime of, uh, of uh, defaming, insulting, or threatening the monarch. Uh, no fault with the method was detected. Um, the, uh, why bring it up now? Well, from 2007 and 2020, there was very little inflation and practically no interest in supposedly anti-inflationary monetary policies. Federal Reserve policy and the discussion thereof was then preoccupied uh, with the financial crisis, with quantitative easing, with the pandemic, and so on and so forth. But from 2021, Inflation returned, and I will say here that it returned as a news story. Uh, I am not going to accept that it, we had inflation in the classic sense. What we did have was a series of news reports on the inflation rate, which were all based upon annualized rates of inflation the last 12 months, uh, which gives after a single spike of inflation of, of, of uh, price increases, uh, gives uh, headlines that continue for a year uh, and enable people who have access to the op-ed pages to talk about it. And this prompted many of our mainstream economic colleagues to suffer what I will call regression toward adolescence. Uh, adolescence, for those of us who, uh, those of you who may not remember it, is a combination of machismo and incoherence. And I'll give you some examples here. This is uh, Larry Summers speaking, uh, writing in May of 2021. Inflationary pressures are mounting from the boost in demand created by two trillion plus in savings uh, from large scale Federal Reserve debt purchases, along with forecasts of essentially zero interest rates into 2024, et cetera. Oh, also some, the stimulus and stock and real estate prices. If you can parse that in coherent terms, you're doing better than I can, but I think this is probably the first time that savings has been have been described as inflationary, and I'm sure the Federal Reserve staff are here here will be pleased to know that their forecasts are themselves inflationary, according to Professor Summers. Um, there is no mention of oil or semiconductors or anything that was actually going on uh, in the economy at that moment. Uh, Ken Rogoff in May of 2022 uh, very uh, in, sort of obliquely points out that the commentary was placing the blame for the current surge in inflation on the Federal Reserve. Jason Furman in August of 2022 uh, talk, uh, mentions both wage and uh, price data, making it clear that inflation is more likely to be rising than falling, uh, and comes to the conclusion that the Federal Reserve will need to stick to its plan of rapid interest rate hikes. And I recall to your memory the great uh, Franklin Roosevelt speech in Madison Square Garden in 1940, when he, he called out Martin Barton and Fish as his obstructionist opponents. Well, these days, it's Jason, Larry, and Ken. Here's another example from uh, Jason Furman in September of 2022, just a few months ago, in which he he, he wrote that the uh, 
The scariest economics paper of 2022 argues that inflation, labor markets remain extremely tight. Underlying inflation is high and possibly rising. Uh, and to get the inflation rate to the Fed's target of 2% by uh, the end of 24, uh, would by that would require an average unemployment rate of about 6.5% in 2023 and 2024. You can't really get clearer or more emphatic than that. But I do know that Professor Furman did not volunteer uh, to take on some of that unemployment himself. His timing was exquisite. Now, this is the Financial Times of November 27th, 2022, uh, in which you can see the headline global inflation likely to have peaked. Uh, key data, data indicators suggest and it reads uh, that um, factory gauge shipping rates, uh, commodity prices and inflation expectations have all begun to subside from their recent record levels. Um, and uh, the headline price growth is set to slow in the coming months. Uh, even more recently than that, Stop Press, December 1st, 2022, which I'm told is just two days ago, uh, they uh, PCE uh, and price index was released, and for the month-on-month -month change was a two, 0.2%, which works out to an annual rate of 2.6, and the headlines fed in a flutter as U.S. inflation softens. Weakening corporate pricing power points to a sharp fall in inflation. So here we are. Uh, I would congratulate the organizers of this meeting uh, for uh, having timed their meeting just in time, because if you'd waited another month, uh, it might be quite stale. But the question then comes up, why is it uh, that our colleagues uh, have been so taken with the notion that we're in a period of, of persistent inflation requiring the kind of response uh, that they have been calling for. And so here's a quick survey of a few archaic ideas. Uh, one is that there's a trade-off between unemployment and inflation, the Phillips curve. That idea was introduced in 1960. It was essentially dead by 1970 and replaced by an even worse idea, which was that there was no trade-off between unemployment and inflation. The vertical Phillips curve, or the Nairu, Nehru, as it sometimes was called. Uh, this, by the way, is, is actual uh, Prime Minister Mr. Nehru, uh, don't trying to confuse the two, uh, but in any event, that was an idea that was an artifact of Milton Friedman's uh, notion that inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. And in thorough support of Friedman, we have Professor Biden uh, just a few months ago saying that fighting inflation is the Fed's job and the rest of the government doesn't need to be concerned with it. Well, what does the Fed have? Well, we've already talked about that this morning, raising interest rates, which is supposed, I don't know what it's supposed to do, control the money supply, uh, control expectations, affect demand. It's supposed to do something in any event, and there's some some process that we can't quite understand. It's very complicated. That therefore fights inflation. All right. These ideas have not been unchallenged. Uh, I give you some evidence from the record. There are at least two articles in the Journal of Economic Perspectives uh, that attack the notion of the neighbor. One of them was published in the winter of 1997. Uh, and and the, uh, um, the other one was published uh, in the winter of 2018, which I calculate as being a 21-year difference between the two articles. Uh, I raised two daughters to voting age uh, in this period. Um, but, uh, uh, and you can see that the second article is considerably softer in tone than its first, but still better late than never to begin to begin to change ideas on this subject. Um, okay, I will turn now uh, to the question of what our paper actually addresses, and that is the question of what does or what did the Fed actually do in the period uh, that we examined. I don't want to detain you with the first part of the paper, which was essentially designed to slip the analysis past the referee, didn't succeed at that. But the second part is what is interesting, uh, I think. So uh, it uses very simple, but I think quite powerful dummy variable regressions to measure the reaction of the Open Market Committee of the Federal Reserve uh, to particular changes in the economic and, and political environment. And these changes are inflation, unemployment, and uh, the election cycle, which I'll come to uh, momentarily. The dependent variable is the yield curve or the difference between the interest rate on 90-day uh, treasury bills and 10-year treasury bonds, which is a very convenient measure of the stance of monetary policy if you're trying to do this over long periods of time, because as you can see, uh, the variation in this variable is 
quite stable with respect to periods of different with different economic conditions, particularly different uh, inflationary uh, uh, inflation rates underlying it. And you can see that there's a very regular pattern that when the yield curve uh, becomes quite flat or inverts that the recessions tend to follow. Uh, so this is something that has provided us a a, a base for the analysis, uh, and what we did was to run a series of models on this uh, on this variable, um, and there were four of them which specified the reaction function in in slightly different ways. The first one took each of uh, four variables separately. If inflation was above a notional target, probably two to three, uh, two to, between two and three percent, or if it was rising. If unemployment was below a notional target at 5.5 percent, I think is what we used, or if unemployment was falling, uh, uh, did the Fed react to that? Second model uh, combines the inflation and the unemployment variables. So, if inflation is high and rising, or if it's low and falling, if unemployment is low and falling, or high and rising, uh, does the Fed react to those circumstances? Model three is consistent with a unambiguous signal from the Taylor rule. Uh, in other words, if in unemployment is, uh, 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 inflation is above and unemployment is below the target both, that would be considered a, uh, a tightening uh, indicator and conversely for an easing indicator. And finally, for completeness, if all the variables, both the changes and the levels point in the same direction, one way or the other. So, the, so you have four different ways of specifying it and two different periods because there is, as has already been discussed this morning, a, a change of the uh, of, of regime, essentially structural change uh, in the early 1980s. Uh, so we ran it for 1969 to 83, and then from 84 uh, to 2006. And here's the results for the first of these periods. And you can see that in this period, uh, there is evidence that the Fed reacts uh, to when it, the Fed reacted when inflation was above uh, the notional target, and also when unemployment was below. Uh, and these two things, of course, sometimes happen simultaneously, but they uh, uh, that is uh, at least the evidence is not, however, very strong. The explanatory power of the variable of the equation is not very high. Uh, we go on to the, uh, and I should say, by the way, just to read the diagram, a negative coefficient here is a tightening of policy as a reduction in the difference between the, the 90 day rate and the, and the 10 year bond rate. Uh, if you move on to 1984 to 2006, uh, then you find that actually the regime is quite different. There is no evidence in this period that the Fed reacted at all uh, to the inflation rate. It did react when the unemployment rate fell below a certain variable, certain value, uh, and it reacted by tightening policy. So we have in this period a pretty clear evidence that the reaction function of the Federal Reserve was based on a fear of excessively high employment did not react when the unemployment rate was above the target, and it did not react to the inflation rate at all. Well, the inflation rate was pretty flat in this period, so that's possibly a reason. But you've got a very clear understanding, regardless of specification, that in this period, the Fed is working to control the rise of, of, of employment and whatever consequences from that it may have feared. Uh, okay, let's move on. Uh, they, did the Fed, was there an element in this that could be traced uh, to uh, the politics of the situation. And this was a period when the Federal Reserve by and large was run by saintly nonpartisan apolitical people who had never been involved in politics. Uh, Arthur Burns, Paul Volcker, Alan Greenspan, Ben Bernanke, well, I joking here, and now Jerome Powell. Uh, but in any event, uh, the question here is raised whether there is a climate of political um, influence which may have an effect on Federal Reserve policy at politically sensitive moments. And that what we chose was to look at the question of whether policy was different in years when there was a presidential election, and if it differed in a systematic way, depending on whether a Democrat or a Republican was in the White House in that particular year. And so you just simply added a couple of dummy variables to the equation, and this is what you come up with. Well, guess what? In the 1969 to 1983 period, each of the uh, political variables has the expected sign, uh, and on if uh, the president was a Republican, it's very strongly significant. Not so much if it was a president uh, it was a Democrat. By the way, there weren't that many examples of it in this period, uh, but the sign in both cases is uh, 
the same and the other variables hold to the positions that they held before. So this is an independent effect uh, uh, in this period. Uh, and when you go to 1984 to 2006, guess what? All of the variables, the political variables, are highly significant, and they're all quite substantial. And what you're looking at here between the difference between a, a, a Democratic and a Republican president in an election year is a difference that's uh, as much as almost 200 basis points, I guess, uh, and uh, along with the effect uh, of, uh, of a low uh, unemployment rate. Uh, and if the unemployment rate is low and the president is a Democrat, uh, as opposed to a Republican, you're looking at about 300 basis points of expected difference in the uh, of expect of a more of a tighter monetary policy, which is very substantial. And if the model is uh, at all relevant to the present situation, it has some bearing on the present situation. So let's go ahead and uh, and and talk about that. The conclusions are first of all general conclusions about the conduct of the Federal Reserve in this period. There's a claim that monetary policy is aimed at fighting inflation. This is what they say. After 1983, there is no evidence that the term structure responds at all to inflation, neither to the level nor to changes in the inflation rate, unless unemployment is giving the same signal. Uh, the claim that the Federal Reserve neglects unemployment is quite wrong. Uh, in fact, the Federal Reserve reacts to low unemployment, that is to say, to a real variable, strongly yeah. indicative of the state of demand, uh, and it does not react uh, when the unemployment is high. Um, and so the third claim, the, the Federal Reserve fights recession. Uh, the, uh, there's no evidence that the Federal Reserve actually re reacted to recessions in this period. Uh, and then finally, on the political point, there is the claim that the Federal Reserve is apolitical. We examine the hypothesis of a federal of a presidential election cycle in the term structure of interest rates. We find compelling evidence that such a cycle existed. Specifically, we find that in the year before presidential elections, the term structure deviates sharply from otherwise normal va va values. When a Republican administration is in office, the term structure in the pre-election year tends to be steeper by values up to estimated up to 150 basis points and monetary policy is accordingly uh, more permissive. When a democratic administration is in office, the term structure tends to be flatter. Uh, these findings are robust across model specifications and across time. Uh, okay. Uh, I will now just give you a quick glance at where the yield curve is now, in case you were wondering. The answer is it's roughly where it was in advance of all the major recessions uh, in the period uh, that we've been looking at and, uh, and, and more recently. Uh, and then, uh, of course, it's a model. It's a model rest based on past behavior. There's no guarantee. Uh, that it will predict what the Federal Reserve will do over the next year. Uh, but we do have some indication, the Wall Street Journal here on November 28th, Feds Williams says the inflation flight could last into 2024. Uh, so don't say that I didn't warn you. Uh, they, uh, I was on November 30th, a Deutsche Bank strategist who had been at the Federal Reserve, by the way, is getting worried that the uh, news is too good. Inflation fear is fading too fast. Gee, I wonder why you would think that. Uh, and I uh, would have to ask, did anybody get this right? Well, uh, Rostenkowski's rule, which I learned as a young member of the congressional staff, holds that he that tooteth not his own horn, the same shall not be tooted. So I'll just give you the headlines from the uh, persistent, uh, uh, persistent anti persistent uh, positions that I've taken over the last year. Uh, and in support of that, I also want to note uh, a slide I just typed up this morning as I was listening to the presentation, uh, that there were um, technical economists, what I called sensible technicians at the Federal Reserve, who shared my view that the inflation would, uh, the price shocks would simply pass through the system because workers did not have the bargaining power uh, to make them uh, persistent. Uh, I think that was entirely correct. And I think that Ken Rogoff was entirely wrong in, uh, uh, in, in attacking the Fed uh, for making that prediction. Uh, but of course, there is a problem, and Isabella Weber has pointed it out, which is that uh, there is a chance of, pers of of, of repeated shocks, and particularly coming from the energy space, uh, where the where we're extremely sensitive to a combination of geological uh, phenomena, which we do not fully understand, uh, and uh, the control of energy supply by financial speculation, which we I think is a very clear danger uh, that we will uh, will generate 
uh, uh, repeated shocks in the future uh, that will uh, percolate through the system uh, and uh, provide further excuses for uh, the restrictive monetary policy uh, that the Federal Reserve may well be under extreme pressure to continue to implement, irrespective of what is happening to inflation or unemployment. Okay, uh, thank you very much. And I believe I've maintained myself within the uh, 20 minutes and I uh, yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so this is a joint paper with, with me and, and Aaron Medlin from UMass. Uh, Federal Reserve Anti-Inflation Policy, Well Protection for the 1%. Aaron insisted on the question mark. I thought we should just put an exclamation mark. <laughs> so we'll see what you think by the end. Um, so as was pointed out uh, before in the conference, I think by Jamie, the Federal Reserve does have a dual mandate uh, to conduct monetary policy so as to promote effectively the goals of maximum employment, stable prices, and moderate uh, long-term interest rates. I don't know why this isn't called a triple mandate, but I guess um, we mostly think about the maximum employment and stable prices. Uh, but the Fed um, has not been pursuing uh, um, full employment. Uh, it's focused on keeping inflation low, uh, 2% is, as Bob pointed out at the beginning, uh, no matter what the cost is to employment. So what happened to the other mandate? What about the uh, employment mandate? Um, in this paper, we're exploring uh, one possible reason for this inflation-obsessed policy, as I think Servas called it. Um, the Fed wants, or at least acts as if it wants, to protect the real wealth of the top 1%. And uh, the issue of wealth has come up uh, in the conference. Tom Ferguson and Sir West Storm raised it, and others have raised it. Um, this doesn't mean this is the only thing the Fed does. The Fed has uh, multiple things it does, perhaps getting um, Republicans elected. I don't know. But uh, it has other things that it does. Uh, but we're going to focus on this as, a, as one important factor driving the Federal Reserve policy. Um, I'm going to start off by some uh, well with some well-known trends. Uh, don't have to linger here about the U-shaped uh, um, change in uh, real wealth distributionally over the post-war period. Everybody has seen this this graph. Um, also, just uh, the general picture of uh, headline inflation, CPI inflation in the U.S. since 1960, um, the ups and downs in the recent spike. But the, the um, one graph I want to spend a little bit of time on is this one. Um, this is uh, um, uh, inflation and the federal funds rate. Federal funds rate is the tool of policy the Fed typically uses. Uh, the dashed line is inflation rate. The red is the federal funds rate. Um, and this is percentage point change. So it's the acceleration of prices. Um, and um, it does differ a little bit from what Jamie was saying in his presentation, where it does seem to be the case uh, that the Fed does raise the federal funds rate when inflation goes up. So this is just the descriptive statistics, which does suggest the Fed, in fact, does respond um, to inflation. Uh, so uh, we might have to sort, sort that out. Uh, but here I want to focus on, um, I don't know why that little red box is up there. Can I hit the... Box here to get rid of it. Thank you. <laughs> Nicole comes to the rescue once again, as she has many times. Um, so the right hand side looks at Fed tightening cycles um, uh, in recent time. Um, and we're focusing on uh, the uh, 
the um, in our simulations, uh, as the left hand diagram shows, inflation has um, gone up by about uh, the uh, six percent. Uh, prices are going up uh, in the, most recently, and um, over this uh, last year or so, uh, in the last nine months, Federal Reserve has raised the federal funds rate three point seven five percent in response. We're going to come back to that and simulate the impact of that on real wealth. Now, uh, from a kind of theoretical perspective or logical perspective, uh, what are some of the impact channels of inflation and restrictive monetary policy on real wealth? Uh, well, unexpected inflation uh, reduces the value um, of, of assets um, and, and liabilities. And so debt debtors benefit while creditors lose. We all tell, tell our students this in macro one. Um, the household savings rate might decline as a result of the need for households to, um, to spend when uh, real wages are constrained. Uh, the second matter is interest rate exposure from contractionary policy. And when interest rates go up, market value of stocks and bonds, um, assets held by primarily the wealthy, uh, goes down. Um, and this is uh, the, the major impact. There might be some impact uh, of increased returns to cash savings and so forth as a result of higher interest rates. Uh, and the uh, poor households tend to hold a higher percentage of their wealth in, in cash and, and liquid assets. Um, the, the point is that um, high inflation erodes the real wealth of creditors and tight monetary policy has mixed impacts on the wealth, wealth of the wealthy. It lowers nominal asset values, but it, it may preserve real value of wealth to the extent that it lowers inflation. The net effect is, is an empirical question of these different for, the net effect of these different forces. Um, so our research question is, what is the impact on wealth and wealth distribution of major increases in inflation rate? So our uh, econometric approach is we use unexpected changes in inflation and unexpected changes in monetary policy to identify the exogenous variation in them. We estimate the impact of inflation shocks on real net wealth, holding other variables constant. And then we estimate the varying impact of these inflation shocks on real net wealth, uh, depending on what the Fed does, depending on the Fed's monetary policy intervention. And um, Aaron's going to take over the next part. Uh, Not me. Um, okay, so uh, just to keep going and uh, stop on here. Uh, for our, our methodology, we use a, an instrumental variable local projections approach, or LPIV, um, which uh, if you're not familiar with local projections, it's just a, an alternative. Sure. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, so local projections is just an alternative approach uh, to vector autoregression to estimate impulse response functions. It's just a fancy way of saying that we estimate the effect of um, impulsing one variable on another over time. Um, and uh, the intramittal variable um, aspect has been uh, recently added to local projections in the past couple of years. And um, there is an, a, a sort of the econometric theory uh, behind how this uh, works and how it's laid out uh, is in Stock and Watson. Um, and we uh, also take inspiration from Aline and uh, her colleagues uh, who recently used the method studying the effects of um, monetary policy and the racial wealth gap. So we're using an, an instrumental uh, uh, instrument variable approach to help address the homogeneity issues, right? Uh, oh, the macro economy is a simultaneous system, right? We need to distinguish between these different effects um, and endogenous responses to them. Um, Fed officials, right, operate in this way. Uh, they are setting policy uh, in response to macroeconomic conditions. And so we want to control for that endogeneity bias by identifying the exogenous component of um, policy changes. So a common method to do this is that um, is to sort of construct partial measures around uh, monetary policy announcement windows. And the most widely used measure um, that, that's in the literature is uh, the Romer and Romer methodology. 
And if you're not familiar with uh, what they do, basically they identify intended changes uh, in the policy rate and then regress those changes on that green book uh, projections of inflation, unemployment, um, and uh, GDP growth, and then they extract the residuals from their regression. And then those are argued for uh, exogenous changes in monetary policy. However, um, it's common to then use the, that sort of measure directly in, say, a VA, VAR uh, kind of uh, regression, but that can uh, produce sort of um, biased results because due to, to measurement error. But to the extent that um, these types of measures um, are, are actually uncorrelated with uh, other variable shocks um, happening, uh, that is a sufficient condition uh, um, that Sock and Watson argue uh, to use them as an instrument on actual changes in the policy rate to identify um, uh, those changes. Um, so that's what we do. Um, we also um, instruments on um, inflation. Inflation is argued as an endogenous process that we need to account for in some way. Um, we use two main instruments, the monetary policy, uh, shocks from Romer, and then we use lagged inflation. That's not the best instrument, but it's the one that goes farthest back to the period that we want to study. Um, we do other, we do try other instruments uh, for robustness, and we get uh, very similar results, uh, which we can look at later if you want. Um, then we use uh, projections per Jorda. That's uh, to construct cumulative pulse response functions that sort of chart the path of the various variables we look at: uh, net wealth over time um, and GD coefficient over time um, in response to uh, impulse shocks to inflation. And then we uh, estimate those again, conditional on monetary policy intervention um, over the short to medium term. This our uh, specification, um, I won't dwell on it just for the sake of time. Uh, that we use various variables uh, for controls in the first stage. And then we also use lag uh, controls in the second stage and that helps group identifications uh, for reasons that I won't go into right now. I'll just note that the two deltas uh, here in the second direction is so my part. Sorry about that. For our data, uh, our observation period is from 1999 to United States. Um, we use annual uh, series on wealth inequality, um, which comes from the inequality database. Um, and this it's uh, mostly picks up on the work of uh, Piketty and, and uh, Sayez. Um, and also Gabriel Zuck is, uh, is a common um, contributor to uh, what's going on with that project. Uh, some people might take uh, some issue with, with how they uh, do things. Um, the reason it is because it's uh, the only, uh, it's the longest consistent time series that's available that would allow us to do a kind of analysis like this, right? All the measures have some sort of gap that um, make time series analysis sort of uh, uh, hard to do. Um, in a, in a set of this. Um, for uh, data on an unemployment rate, inflation, GDP, and all the stuff, uh, controls, sort of, that was from Fred. Um, and then uh, I already said our monetary policy shocks come from uh, Roma, which we get from, from uh, uh, Brecken Life. Um, I'll turn it over to Jerry to explain the main result. Hey, Karen. Yeah, just lower this. Yes, thank you. Thanks for reminding you. Okay, so again, we're we're looking at this um, uh, this period. Gonna, we estimated over an earlier period, but we're doing simulations based on what's happened recently uh, with the six percent increase in inflation and the three point seven five uh, points interest rate increases. Um, in fact, we're going to uh, look at first of all a two percent increase in uh, Federal Reserve interest rate, a two hundred basis point, and then we're also three hundred seventy five basis point uh, increase. Our objective is to see the impacts of tight monetary policy on real net wealth and institution when inflation is high. So um, a lot of our graphs are going to look like this. The, uh, the, um, the sh shaded area is a, gives us a 90% confidence interval, and this is going to be important for figuring out uh, what's significant and what's not. So let's just look at the far left uh, graph of the Gini coefficient. Um, this says is if you have a six percent uh, increase in inflation, uh, that has an equalizing effect. The Gini is lower, and that's because um, it uh, hurts creditors and helps at this 
standard story. Um, so uh, uh, this does not take into account income loss. It's all about real wealth. So it's equalizing in the terms of its impact on real wealth. We're not talking about all the problems that Nancy and others have talked about on income. Um, so this is looking at the impact of uh, the 6% uh, inflation shock on the average real value of wealth of various groups. And uh, what you can see is that for the top 1%, that's the far left uh, graph, um, it is the uh, real wealth of the top 1%. Um, and it's statistically significant. It also lowers the wealth of the top 10%. That's the middle graph. Um, but it raises, and this is the net wealth, it raises the net real wealth of the bottom 50%, uh, the bottom 50% being uh, debtors. Now we say, inflation. what happens if the Federal Reserve then um, raises interest rates uh, to fight inflation or to elect a Republican, whichever you know, story you want to believe here? Um, <clears throat> Uh, in order to, uh, so raises interest rates by, by 2%. In here, the key thing, the key thing here, I don't know if you can see, but the key thing here is this shaded area, the this the two shaded arrows, and the clear space in between. Whenever we have a, we're at ranges, um, this is the ninety percent confidence intervals. If we have a space in between, that means they're significantly different. Okay, so I'll explain it. If that means uh, in a minute. So what does this left graph show, the top 1%? Um, this dashed line is the impact of the high inflation, the 6% inflation on, well, of the top 1%. It goes down. The blue line is what happens if, on top of the inflation shock, the, the Federal Reserve raises interest rates um, by um, 200 basis points. The real wealth goes down by less. And they're statistically significant. So it protects the wealth of the top 1%. It doesn't increase the wealth um, overall, but as a counterfactual relative to no, no interest rate increase, um, the real wealth of the top 1% is higher. Whereas it doesn't, in this case, have any statistically significant impact on the uh, other two groups. And here's what happens if it's even tighter, 6% increase in interest rates. Red line is that it protects the well, the real wealth of the top one percent more. It can't completely reverse it unless it raises interest rates more, but it does protect the wealth. So as the counterfactual, it, it improves the wealth of the top one percent. Uh, the ten percent um, in this particular regression is is not significantly different, except a little bit, um, and has no significant. Uh, impact on the, on the wealth of the uh, bottom 50%. So the summary is that in the face of high unexpected inflation, sizable contractionary Fed policy increases the wealth of the top percent relative to the case of no contractionary policy. It's wealth protection device um, for the top In some regressions, and it does also help the ten, top 10%. But it has no significant contraction. Contractionary policy has no statistically significant impact on the real wealth of the bottom percent. What do we have left? You have uh, two. Oh, only two minutes. So for a little while. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see. Sorry, sorry. Maybe you can just go a couple of and go to the end. Yeah. Or do you want me to do? Oh. Uh, So it might help that 
of 100 basis point rise in the policy rate. Um, that reduces uh, inflation, but it does take two to three years. So a um, if it if you just use a simple scalar, uh, 50 basis points would be required to reduce inflation by one percent. Right. Okay. Now let's uh, compare right separately what the effect is of uh, uh, um, the effect of uh, inflation versus uh, mo contractual monetary policy on uh, real net wealth. Um, so uh, just reference the tables here. If you just multiply by 100, right, that gives you a percent change. So uh, as you can uh, clearly see, if we just focus on three, right, so that's going to um, reduce wealth uh, for the uh, top 1% by about 8%, for the top 10, about 6%, and for the bottom 50, about 5%. Um, it's raising their wealth, right? Their net wealth. Um, it's a benefit to them. And that's what we really see from the, the lines there, right? Okay. Now let's uh, just compare that uh, real quickly to uh, real net wealth. And um, as we can see, reduces wealth for the one in top 10. And, um, it's an ambiguous effect for uh, 50, at least, um, you know, after uh, three years. Okay. Well, the thing to note here is that the impact to the wealthy is less, right? Okay. Uh, right. Yeah. Uh, so if we compare the the counterfactual, it's enough to uh, the top one percent. Um, so I'm going to skip to the end here. So um, in the of high inflation, contractionary Fed policy does appear to act as a wealth uh, protection device, or at least a wealth enhancing device. The top one percent, and in some cases, may the maybe the top at ten percent. Um, in a separate paper, we we do study the effects of expansionary monetary policy on wealth, and we um, and we look at in low inflation environments, and we do see that um, expansionary monetary policy has a much more uh, positive effect. Uh, disproportionately enhances the real wealth of the top one percent relative to to the bond bar. Protection here, um, top one percent may help explain both expansionary um, as well as contractionary policy, depending on the inflation environment. That's our uh, conclusion. So uh, I'll get there. It's not a perfect, not a perfect uh, process, but uh, okay, thank you. All right. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So this presentation is going to rely quite a bit on visuals. If you want to move forward, there are a few more spots up so you'll have a better experience. Um, thanks very much for inviting me to this conference, um, Bob and Jerry. Um, we found out late that my research dovetails quite well with yours on, um, you know, the effects on wealth, um, or perhaps the effects on income based on wealth. And also, this paper is very complementary to a lot of papers that have taken the necessary step down from the lofty heights of macro to the ground floor of, of sectoral level. Now this presentation, this research comes up from the underground micro level, from the individual firm level to look at the sectoral level. And um, it's a very serendipitous um, co um, combination of previous research. We have heard Isabella Weber's research on sectoral inflation and also uh, inflation and um, some of them, and they're all very necessary because it's a very labor intensive undertaking. We've been working on stranded assets in oil and gas. And so we're using some of the methods we developed there. And also there's Ben Brown from MPI Cologne, who knows more than most about asset managers. And you'll see why that's important. So um, presentation is about who profits from energy price inflation in the United States. So this is squarely in the distribution effects part of this conference, maybe with a couple of general uh, insights for what can be done, but uh, just many suggestions. Okay, so some people clearly profit from 
inflation. This is, uh, you know, Exxon Mobil, the largest um, stock market listed oil company in the world, happens to be headquartered in the US. So the CEO felt very um, personally attacked by the Biden administration saying, well, maybe the profits are too high and, you know, thinking about wealth taxes, I'm sorry, windfall taxes, obviously also prior to the midterm election. And uh, Darren Woods here says there has been discussion in the US about our industry returning some of our profits directly to the American people. In fact, that's exactly what we're doing in the form of our quarterly dividend. So that was very nice. Uh, so basically what I'm going to try to show you is who actually gets these quarterly dividends and what, how that impacts the inflation rate. Um, I'm sorry, I'm being just a little bit hampered here and seeing my own screen. Um, now I see it better. Okay. And um, yeah, so the redistributive effects of inflation, you know, um, higher energy prices translate to cost for most, but the higher profits benefit some. And uh, the focus in this debate, in the sectoral debate, tends to be on oil corporations. But who are the intermediate and ultimate beneficiaries? Um, these profits, redistribute income, they also impact the effective inflation uh, felt by those who get some of these profits. So we ask, what are the distribution effects from higher oil and gas profits? And how do these profits affect net inflation for different groups? Let me talk about our methodological approach and the data. So first of all, we're only looking here at United States-based beneficiaries, that is the people in the US, not necessarily oil corporations in the US. We're looking at the quarter two of 2022, um, but you know uh, we're working on other profits. You actually see some time series too, but the distribution effects will focus on this quarter alone. You'll see why. We only look at profits originating in stock market listed companies for now, globally, but we also have preliminary results for non-listed company, that is family owned companies. Think of Koch Industries as actually the large, largest one amongst them. And we are only sectorally, we're only looking at oil and gas companies and their field service providers. Think Halliburton, right? Famous because of the former vice president. Um, so when, but we also look at downstream sectors that would be impacted by the oil price shocks and see how they pass on these shocks, like fertilizers, petrochemicals, and other direct users. Um, but again, whatever is not in parentheses is the thing I'm showing you today. So how do we do this? Well, first, we collect quarterly company profits. And uh, I want to just shout out to Evan Wasner and the audience here who has been doing a marvelous job on that. Um, then we uh, link these profits to their beneficial owners using um, a ownership network for all stock market listed companies. And a lot of these profits are actually intermediated by uh, funds um, that are managed by asset managers. And then we allocate these beneficial owners into the wealth distribution so that very nicely you, sh you showed the top 1%, the top 10%. What parts of these beneficial owners can we say are where in the wealth distribution? So that's, if you, if you follow me here, you, you really get the whole result. Um, you know, we use a variety of sources for profits. We mostly rely on Refinitiv, but also others. And we need to make some uh, assumptions about what happens when profits aren't reported at a quarterly frequency, for instance. And um, for the funds intermediation and really also the beneficial owners, we use the Orbis database of global company ownership. And we use a network propagation model so that you, you know, if you get a profit, but you're owned by someone, the profit propagates to them to the leaves of the network when there's nothing more to propagate. And um, in order to allocate these profits, we use the Fed distribution accounts, which are really wonderful. And we're also using a, a SUSB, which I forget what it stands for in the census. It's, it tells you about the business size uh, to, to make, but that's not so key. So, you know, really the Fed distribution accounts here. And uh, to illustrate this a little bit for you, this is all basically about network structure of data. So we feed profit data into the oil and gas companies. That's the shock. The shock propagates through the network. Um, and, and with this Orbis ownership data, I'm sorry, I shouldn't turn around. I was told um, I'll look down and still there. Um, and, um, but you know, it also propagates even further um, when, you know, sometimes 
So who's behind the holding company? Well, maybe we don't know that. So there might be unknown shareholders, which however, we can then use the FAT categories to assign them. Uh, there may also be pension funds that are investing directly in oil and gas companies. However, most of the pension funds and other um, um, clients of fund managers um, are actually sourced from the SEC and financial accounts data. So that's a different data set. And we also then find other persons that own these profits or have a claim on these profits. And finally, then we allocate this to the distribution. So um, time is fairly short. Uh, oh, by the way, there are of course also governments and nonprofit organizations and the rest of the world that takes part in US oil company profits or also in you know, that US based fund managers uh, manage the wealth of. So these are just sync nodes. When the profit reaches them, it leaves the network, okay? So in principle, not much needs to be left over in the US after, um, you know, BlackRock certainly meant uh, the funds of clients worldwide. But, um, spoiler alert, a lot is left. Um, in fact, more comes in than goes out because we're also looking, of course, at oil and gas companies that are listed in other countries, but that are owned partly by American, by US American shareholders. This is an example. Um, you may choose to disregard it, but uh, you know it, it's just supposed to, to illustrate that the, the profits from the oil and gas company might, might for instance, go to 60% to fund managers. And just to be clear, we, we have individual fund managers. So we have a, a network of about 400,000 um, um, ownership nodes, but they're aggregated into categories. So, so 60% go to all the fund managers that the oil and gas company uh, is being owned by, uh, and they own 60% of the company's shares. Well, perhaps 10% are owned directly by a bank or by an insurance company as equity. And um, you know there are some subsidiaries or some other companies that might in turn be uh, owned by some other companies that are not classified as financial companies. Otherwise, they would be in the other two big nodes. And there might even be some high net individuals, high net worth, very high net worth persons that's defined as a person owning more than $30 million um, in case you, you care to know. Um, but basically very rich persons that are so rich that they show up individually in our database because they own such a large share of the company that they need to disclose that and, and, and these database providers can capture that. So we have a little bit of that. And then it propagates further. So of course the fund managers profits are owed to 100% to the client. So it's important to keep in mind here that BlackRock in this um, gets nothing from this, right? BlackRock only passes on profits. Of course, BlackRock gets the fees. So that's maybe future research, but um, they get it whether or not the oil company makes a profit. Um, now, there are also hedge funds and private equity for which this is a little bit different, but we also um, uh, pass, um, pass this uh, through the fund managers and through their clients, which include, of course, the owners of the private equity fund who get part of that carry, carry interest. Um, okay, so ultimately, all the 100% go back to $100 go into the wealth distribution. So what kind of size of the database uh, are we looking at? You know, uh, I said we're coming from the micro level, so we're having a universe of nearly 1,400 listed oil and gas companies. Um, and uh, we have also about 70,000 unlisted oil and gas companies, only those that are located in the US for the simple reason that it's very hard to find the owners of <laughs> non-listed companies. And when they're located in the US, it's likely that they're owned by US persons, okay? So that's a simplifying assumption. Um, there's about $320 billion in the second quarter of 22 that is to be distributed to owners globally, okay? And 41 billion are uh, earned by Saudi Aramco. And uh, so that's that's a chunk out of that, but also ExxonMobil, for instance, uh, earned 20 billion. So, so this is how, you know, there are a few big fishes and then a lot much smaller fishes. And the 70,000 unlisted companies add another 20 billion or so. So they're actually not that large compared to the listed ones. Now we have about 390,000 in the ownership um, network that we pass the shocks through. And then we also reclassified about 7,000 financial companies because um, you know, the, classic, the sector classifications are, are limited um, uh, 
Um, so we, we want to understand their functions, not necessarily the um, sector that is that is given to them by the database provider. So results, I need to say one thing, please do not share these results. This is uh, research entirely in progress and there may be mistakes and they are not published anywhere. So please do not do that for now. Um, so, you know, the global picture about profits is one that we would expect. This is aggregated up from the stock market listed firms. So you see that globally profits have been actually negative in 2020 in the sector, but then they have been become positive and very high. So in the second and third quarter here, although we see a drop in the third quarter at the United States level, that's a different, uh, the largest number here is about 300 billion. I mentioned 319, right? That's that second quarter here. United States is about, uh, this is 100 billion here. And so it's a little bit below 100 billion US dollars by United States based, that is listed firms. Okay. And again, very negative profits here uh, in 2020. But uh, current profits, of course, much higher than, than the historical trend. And um, this is just to illustrate that, you know, uh, if we just look at annual year on year changes in quarters, you can see a steep ascent from 2020 to 2022. And uh, conveniently, we're looking at the second quarter. We didn't cherry pick this. This was actually the only data available, the latest data available when we started. However, you'll also see that for the United States in particular, profits are still pretty high. Okay. Uh, Another little look at the international scene before we delve squarely into US profits. So this is um, the second quarter of 2019 where profits were perhaps sort of regular or some, in some sense. Um, and you can see that SA, which is Saudi Arabia, made the largest profits in the second quarter uh, 19, almost entirely because of Saudi Aramco, the national oil company, which is listed, so it reports its profits. Um, and you see a few other countries. It's a ragged line because the countries are ordered according to their profits in the second quarter of 2022. Now, this is the same axis on the X, uh, sorry, same scale on the X axis. We have up to 80 billion profit there on the scale. And actually the US made something more like 90 billion. So profits in absolute terms have actually increased most in companies in the United States. And they're there, you can see they're by far the largest globally. Okay. So um, uh, there's actually Russia here, um, in case you wondered. Russian companies have also been making a lot of profits, um, but also, for instance, Great Britain, uh, the United Kingdom, where, where Shell and uh, BP are listed. Um, so another preliminary result here is that. So on the left-hand side are the U.S. corporate profits, and this, this is now all second quarter 2022. U.S. corporate profits, you know, somewhat above 80 billion. We saw this on the previous slide. But once we propagate the profits to the beneficial owners, it actually shoots above 100%. Now, this is a net transfer. We also propagated some profits out. Um, so because of the structure of the financial system, a lot of profits from around the world end up in the pockets of United States-based shareholders. Okay, now in some sense, this is already going a lot uh, far towards our um, final result here. Um, yeah, but um, I want to show you one more graph. And for that graph, it's helpful to keep these colors in mind. You saw this actually before. There are quarterly company profits, blue, funds intermediation, red, beneficial owners, orange. These are the beneficial owners here. Okay, but then we're using the Fed, Fed distribution accounts categories to use the beneficial owner profits to distribute them into the wealth distribution. So there's a fifth intermediate step here. I mean, it's the fourth uh, intermediate step and then the allocation is uh, in purple. And that's what you get. Um, now I told you, you <laughs> might not see everything from the back, but um, um, a couple of main uh, takeaways. So first of all, a lot more profits come in from the rest of the world, oil and gas companies, the blue bar down here, then go to the rest of the world from US oil companies by shareholders abroad, which of course are actually quite a sizable portion. Now, we also see that most of the profits from actually about half of the profits, sorry, from the United States based companies are intermediate by asset, intermediate by asset managers of one sort or another. Um, you also see hedge funds uh, playing a very small role. And then there's private equity. We spoke about this before. 
problem with private equity is they don't own oil and gas companies, they own oil and gas operations themselves, and they show up mostly in the non-listed company field. So private equity is <laughs> only uh, their participation in stock market listed oil and gas companies rather than the direct owning them. Um, but you also see that asset managers actually own more than half of the profits abroad, which is kind of owing to their, of course, diversification strategy um, being operation, operating in virtually every stock market listed company in the world. Then you have a whole bunch of categories here at the ultimate owner level. Um, and, um, you know, what is perhaps of interest are the pension funds up here. So the height of the bar tells you how many profits, uh, what share of these roughly 110 billion profits are in pension funds. Um, and, you know, well, okay. Um, and the, um, so pension funds is actually not such a big participant in these profits. Um, so uh, pension funds, which are the most equally distributed of wealth, because at least, um, you know, the majority of people maybe, uh, well, you can correct me on that. I don't know that, but you know, more people own pension funds than have a family office man managing their funds. But we also have basically households. So that's your mutual funds owners, your net, nest egg, owning a lot of asset managers. And then the other thing that you should see here is the non-financial listed firms where our propagation doesn't reach an actual beneficial owner, but just some company. We don't know who owns the company. Um, so here we are assuming that all of these, uh, you know, only partially propagated profits are owned as a corporate equity by someone, by fairly small shareholders, right? Because um, pension funds and um, and and uh, sorry, uh, asset managers tend to own very large chunks. So you see them in the um, in the distribution, and we also use some controls from the. 11F form uh, that tells you basically for every company what share of the company is owned by institutional shareholders. Anyway, so here are the the this, the, the the fat categories, and that's how it works into the wealth distribution. Um, I'll show this to you again. Here, I just want to notice that the bottom 50% get nothing basically. Yeah, it's almost all goes to the upper half, and really, and let me show this to you here: 80% go to the top 10%. And that's an interesting complementary result to what you were showing that in this last inflationary episodes, because it was uh, a supply side driven inflation that gen generated large profits in some sectors, notably oil and gas, uh, this had a very regressive distributionary effect. You know, the top 1% get almost half of these profits. Now I'm really almost out of time. Um, so I just want to relate this to inflation rates. This is a very simple exercise, and I'd be glad for your input, but the top 0.1% of wealth holders had a disposable income of no more than 216 billion, probably less. The total fossil fuel profits in the second quarter was 20 billion. That's an increase of 16 billion relative to the same year, uh, uh, quarter a year before. So it's a nominal increase in the um, disposable personal income of 7.5%. Now, TCE index and CPI index uh, rose by about that margin. And so basically all of the inflation for this group and also for the rest of the top 1% was more or less um, made good by um, their increased profits. And you see the bottom zero is bottom 50%. Basically, it doesn't make any difference at all. Okay, well, there's... A a lot of extensions that I'm very excited to talk about with you, but the takeaways I have to stop is that, um, you know, profits have risen most in the US, um, leading, they're even higher for shareholders uh, because of net transfers from abroad, and almost half of the profits accrue to the top 1% wealth holders, 80% to the top 10 wealth holders, and uh, in offsetting inflation, and therefore, if there's a policy such as windfall taxes, this actually disproportionately hurts the rich meaning lots of political resistance, but also really, uh, you know, it doesn't really hurt anybody else in terms of it would be a very progressive policy. Thank you. Uh, no, not yet. Okay. Well, I was to let Aaron get in. Uh... Yeah.
Right. Okay. Great. Well, uh, this has been a uh, really uh, fantastic and inspiring conference, and that was a great session. Uh, I'm uh, Michael Ash will offer some uh, some comments on it. Uh, the first one is to be taken a little bit wryly, but I do want to talk about it a little bit. I'd like to point out that if it's um, that if we find ourselves joined in foxholes during crises, everyone else, everyone else becomes a Keynesian. There's a certain irony here in that during a different flavor of crisis, we've all become real business cyclists. Um, so, you know, quoting from Wikipedia, my, 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 my preferred source, according to real business cycle theory, business cycles are therefore real and that they do not represent a failure of markets to clear, but rather the structure, uh, but, but, uh, but rather the structure uh, um, the, the most efficient possible operation of the economy given given the structure of the economy. Um, and RBC theory is associated with freshwater economics, uh, the Chicago School of Economics. So um, to elaborate on this for a second, uh, back in 2007, 8, and 9, I held in contempt anyone who suggested that the problem was micro. So you may recognize this quote, people who spend their lives pounding nails in Nevada need something else to do. That's a, uh, that's a Eugene Fama quote, um, and it was said to appropriately great derision. The problem was obviously financial uh, and, uh, and macro, and uh, that derision uh, is at least doubly deserved for anyone who puts the Great Depression uh, in, uh, in, in real business cycle terms. So a couple of sort of remarks to make about that. Communicating about contemporary inflation is pedagogically challenging for us in the academy, and also from testimony that we heard here yesterday, for journalists communicating with the public and for experts at research institutions communicating with the public, journalists, and public uh, decision makers. Um, you know, I've been teaching introductory macro for a while, and I sound like an old man telling Winters used to be really cold back in the old days because you had to convince students that inflation might once have existed and could exist again. Recessions they knew about plenty, often from very you know upset and personal and family experiences. But inflation is on the new side for them. So after you build up this beautiful Keynesian framework, the students rightly ask, "So isn't the current inflation, the current situation, just like a recession, but in reverse?" Um, and so analyzing the contemporary inflation is an economy. Is, so, so 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 that's a little bit of a a, a bit of a challenge. Analyzing the contemporary inflation is also an econometric challenge, as we're seeing, because um, of the long period of low inflation. So it's very difficult to say things about, you know, inflation does this or inflation does that when inflation hasn't changed that much. And that's altered the kinds of series that are available. You know, we've got these wonderful new series like the Fed distributional accounts, but they only exist over a period that's been very low inflation. So, you know, we're forced into, I mean, nothing wrong with the world uh, inequality database, but, you know, kind of we're, we're constrained. Um, speaking to Aaron and, and Jerry's paper. Um, and in terms of other pedagogical challenges um, and, and other not just pedagogical research challenges, if we take up the analysis uh, of, of Gregor, analysis that Isabella shared yesterday, Josh Mason shared, uh, offered reflections on, turns out that we don't know that much about how to plan sectoral transitions. So I've been looking recently at the electrical energy sector and the extent to which a generation of liberalization and deregulation have, dis have diminished the capacity for planning, even in this highly networked and in many ways centralized sector like electricity is really shocking, all the more so in sectors where, we've, where you know, planning has been off the table for, for years. Um, so, uh, so let me uh, remark on Gregor's paper, um, which I thought was just, uh, so let me offer praise for the paper that Gregor presented for its rigorous dissection of a particular uh, sector. The methods are terrific. I really don't have a lot of recommendations. Uh, one is that a bottom line contribution of fossil fuels to overall inflation or an assignment of the proceeds of, infl of the fossil fuel inflation to the owners of fossil fuel assets would be interesting. That you know, it may be a substantial, maybe really a substantial share of all of the inflation may have been absorbed by this, uh, by this top, and it just it's a one liner, but I think it would be useful. Um, I also have a, uh, a modest uh, contribution to the analysis of sectors. If I could have my slide, uh, please let me uh, make sure I get the right one. I'm not supposed to look at that. I have to look at the mic. Uh, next, nope, not this one, next one. This one. Yeah, so this is a slide. This is, this is interesting. Hat tip to Robert Armstrong of the Financial Times for this slide. 
This shows the blue line there shows the producer price index, which if you recall um, for final goods. So that's what do producers receive kind of at the factory gate, well, at the factory gate, not the factory gate, at the shipment, shipment at the, in the shipping uh, yard. Um, what do they receive for the things being sold? And this uh, starts in January of 2021. You can see there's about a 10% increase in receipts by, um, by, uh, by in, in, in receipts by, um, by uh, companies. Um, there's a distinction here, and that's what I'd like to point to. I think that this is an interesting identification of a particular sectoral advantage, uh, sectoral taking advantage. The, um, the red line has the wholesale and retail markup of goods attached, and the blue line is strictly those received prior to wholesalers and retailers. So, um, so, so to read this or something on the order of, if you weren't a wholesaler or retailer, you got about 10% more. If you look at what the whole economy was paying, it's more like 13% uh, more. That's a three percentage point wedge that seems to have disappeared into quote unquote trade services. The, um, the, 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 the benefits provided, you know, the, the services provided by, by retailers and wholesalers in the economy. So that's a pretty substantial share of the, of the, entire, of, of the entire inflation it seems to have disappeared into higher markups. I don't promise I'm using these series correctly um, because I'm new to them, but I think that this is, I'd, I'd be happy to, 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 to discuss uh, more. Um, so it also raises the question, uh, I think there's, uh, what, what, what's, what's, what's to be done and do we have the expertise? So I think developing sector-specific expertise for that kind of you know, for, for interventions is really is really valuable. Second, I'd like to flag um, some something uh, I thought was interesting from uh, Josh Mason's talk yesterday. I offered I think offered some thoughts on a principled approach to the asymmetry. Why we're not real by why we're not being unprincipled. Uh, look at the sectors when it's inflation, but look at the uh, look at the macro when it's unemployment. Not all is equal when aggregate demand falls below output, but falls, and when aggregate demand is above some notion of potential GDP. Price rises quite possibly quite sharply in particular sectors. Though merely in the spirit of your rigorous self-criticism and diehard Keynesianism, I would propose that we make sure that our newfound admiration for real business cycle theory is subjected to rigorous uh, sectoral uh, tests. Um, some thoughts on um, some, some 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 thoughts on uh, on, on, on Aaron and Jerry's uh, paper. Um, so I think that the effects of uh, inflation um, are ambiguous. Uh, so one remark I'd make is that the bottom fifty percent have incredibly little net wealth. So even if there's a substantial percentage increase, it might be useful to report it like literally in dollars. How little is at stake? If I go back to my first slide here, please. This is an effort to take a look at the effect of inflation on debtors. So what you have in the black line repeated in each of these is, the, is um, CPI inflation, less, less fuel and less, less fuel. And the lines, the, the colored lines uh, from uh, going from top to bottom are uh, debt service. Um, and so you might think that uh, inflation would reduce debt service. Now, these are equilibrium outcomes. So you might say, oh, in case of inflation, I'll take on more debt. We might think that this, this debt service as a fraction of income. So if incomes go up with inflation, but debt service on pre previously contracted obligations don't, then you might think that periods of inflation would be associated with reducing debt service. And I very much don't see a, re a reaction here. I, I, I don't I don't. See you know, if you take a look at, again, there isn't that much inflation over this period, but if you look at the periods of higher inflation, they're not associated with reduced debt service. If you have consumer debt in the top panel, then mortgage debt, where you might really think, oh, okay, so some inflation is nice if, you're, if, you, hold mortgage, if you hold mortgages. I really don't see the, the periods of modest additional inflation associated with reduced debt service or the periods of low inflation associated with, with more debt service in particular. Uh, so the debt service is debt service to income. So it's what people are paying in debt service. So nominal debt service over nominal income. Uh, but if you're in, but, but you know, if your debt service is a hangover from debt incurred, you might expect some drop in debt service. Maybe I've got this wrong too. I make no promises. I know what I'm, I know what I'm doing here. Um, so, so that's, uh, how is my time? Please? Oh, great. Okay, thanks. So, uh, so, I, so, so I went looking for effects of inflation, potentially redistributive effects of inflation, and I would like to, you know, kind of pursue the idea that debtors benefit 
from inflation. And again, with caveats, uh, I see limited, um, lim lim limited, um, limited, limited views, um, limited, limited evidence. Um, I have some questions I think are for Jerry and for Aaron and for, 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 for James Galbraith. Um, that one, one is um, on the disequalizing effect of high asset prices. Uh, I'm, I'm very confused about, about the disequalizing effect of high asset prices. People have told me you know, it has a nom, you know, Jerry, I think Jerry and Aaron started to uh, indicate it has a nominal uh, that the high asset prices, low interest rates, nominally inflate asset prices, nominally increase uh, the wealth of rich people who are asset holder asset holders. But there seems to be some question about whether that would go away rapidly if interest rates rise. So, so, I'm, so, I'm, so, it's kind of there's a core question here: Has there been a break in the hard money banker view of the world? What, um, what has the relationship between finance, you know, between between the world of finance and and interest rates uh, changed? They used to like low inflation because that was very protective of uh, of, of 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 phenomenal returns. But now, is there a low interest constituency for elevated for high for low interest rates and elevated asset prices? I'm 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 I am truly uh, truly uh, confused um, confused about that. Um, so, uh, in respect to James Galbraith's paper, I want to uh, appreciate uh, the paper very much. I think it really does a pretty terrific job uh, indicating, uh, in indicating the non, you know, indicating these non this non responsiveness of the Fed uh, to uh, to unemployment. One of the things I want to like about it methodologically is the tabulation econometrics that involves judgment, saying these are situations under which you might expect interest rates to rise or interest rates to uh, to, to, to you know, the Fed to take a, a more expansion or more contractionary monetary policy that involves judgments, but then you get a very straightforward evaluation of the cases. I think it would be good to show the joint distribution of the situation. So we had situations uh, that called for expansion, situations that called for contraction. It'd be nice to see when and where. I think some of the later tables might do that, but nice, nice to see when and where those two, those two were in those different situations applied, so we can see the the medicine that was uh, the, the medicine that was uh, delivered. I think it'd actually be helpful in terms of lessons for the paper by Jerry and Aaron um, that you know connect connecting this uh, judgments about situations, creating episodes in which you can tr then track the uh, the the outcomes for unemployment. Uh, for for excuse me for the the outcomes for um, uh, the outcomes for inflation and the outcomes for uh, the outcomes for well excuse me for wealth inequality based on episodes of inflation or interest rate hikes. I think so. Again, I would recommend sort of additional clarity that I think is very present in the Galbraith paper about incidents or episodes and what what come comes out. There are some surprises in the in in in, in James Galbraith's paper uh, when the so. Finds when the unemployment rate is above target and rising, no model for the post 1984 period shows any shows any easing, and um, that came as a, as a you know I, I wasn't shocked by the overall finding of the Fed's uh, orientation, but it was a little bit of a surprise if you think about the Greenspan forbearance on interest rate increases in the late 1990s. So the unemployment rate fell. It didn't look like there was a so that forbearance seems relevant. The response, Greenspan's response to the 2001.com bubble collapse, um, Bernanke's response to the 2007-8 great financial crisis. So I'd like a little, I was a little bit surprised that the results are so stark uh, on no response, you know, no response to unemployment crises. I'm just, just would like to understand better how that emerges from the, um, from, from the study. Uh, I have a number of other sort of more minor questions, like we're shown this interest rate spread, um, the 10-year minus three-month bond spread, does that fully capture, does, first, does that fully capture term structure? I'm perfectly willing to believe it does, but it's one piece of term structure. And one of the challenges, you know, you look at the term structure, there are a lot of parts. That seems like a pretty good capture of term structure. But I'm also curious, that it captures monetary policy. In some ways, it, it's the interest rate spread is an outcome as well as a result of result of policy. So you've got a number of different moving pieces, the three month, the 10 year, and the federal funds rate. Uh, and so I'd just like to be more certain. I have a slide dedicated to it, but maybe I will, I will, I will skip that. Um, 
I think that there may be an, it may be an appendix that looks at midterm elections where, you know, if you want to look at systematically uh, systematic disasters for uh, the Democratic Party, the midterm elections have been a site of those. So I'd be interested in not just the, um, the presidential elections, but also the, the midterm elections. Again, there may be, may, there may be an appendix. Uh, I think interestingly enough, the list of Fed chairs, I didn't hear Janet Yellen's name on the list. Curiously enough, I, I guess uh, this sounds like a terrible thing to say, but the sinking of, uh, of, 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 of Hillary Clinton had at least something to do with this sort of you know, tightening and uh, mini, mini, mini recession, I think. Mini recession of, um, of 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 2016. Uh, finally, to integrate some of the papers, and I'll I'll, I'll wrap up early. Uh, I think it's very interesting to look at who gets the proceeds from inflation. If it's from macro overheating, then maybe it's a class struggle model. If it's from micro sectoral sources, then maybe it's monopolistic profits. We're getting insight into that. If it's from negative supply shocks, uh, like we may be coming to see in the world of a change in climate, then is it simply burned up? It's just, you know, it's just more costly and expensive to make things than we used to. And that's, that's really unfortunate. I think I'm going to stop there. We have about uh, we have about twenty five minutes for questions. Can I ask the first one? Can I use moderator's privilege, even though you're carrying the mic? I have one too. Um, so I, there's a couple different stories that have been happening in the inflation debate. Um, this question is mostly for Jerry and Aaron, but I think Gregor as well. That um, profit seeking has reinforced inflation. Um, and then we know from Gregor's work that then those profits were filtered to through to the very wealthy. But your paper also shows how the distributive wealth effects, I mean, this is established. We know there's a lag in monetary policy. And in that sort of two to three year period, wealth is redistributed from the wealthier to the less wealthy, albeit protected somewhat through higher interest rate responses. And so it seems like through profit seeking activity, they cause inflation, which then chips away at their own wealth. And so sort of what is the sum effect or am I misunderstanding sort of what is happening? And is it also sort of similar to what Michael said at the end? Is it just sort of burned up? Is there these effects that are just burned up? Okay. Yeah, we'll take Josh. Yeah, we'll take four. Those are all fascinating papers, but I want to uh, ask a question to Gregor, um, which is really quite amazing. I didn't even know a lot of this data existed, but I, I do have a couple of questions about it. First of all, um, if I'm reading your figure correctly, it looks like the large majority of all oil profits generated in the world end up being paid to U.S. households. Now, Maybe that's true, and if it's true, it's a very interesting and important fact about the world, but it also, to me, suggests maybe there's something missing from the picture. Some of that is obviously non-listed firms, and that's fine, and, and you've obviously you're working on that, but maybe more concerning is the possibility you've missed some relevant flows. And again, just looking at your picture, in particular, it appeared to me that your corporate equities box all flowed to U.S. households when of course a large fraction of US corporate equities are owned by the rest of the world. So that I, I was concerned if there might be an important missing outflow there or perhaps elsewhere that explains this kind of astonishing seeming fact. Um, that's one. Two, um, I wonder, are oil company profit flows different from other company profit flows? I, I love what you've done here. It's, 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 it's just, it's, it's amazing. It's, it's, it's just, model empirical work. But I, I do sort of wonder if that's if it's overkill in terms of answering the question we're interested in. If we just started with the hypothesis, oil company profits are distributed like other corporate profits, would our final picture be noticeably different? That's and then one one more question. I'm sorry. There's a big problem here, I think, for you and for this methodology, which is that a very large fraction of corporate profits today are distributed via buybacks rather than dividends. Buybacks are just an incredibly difficult problem for this sort of accounting work. They're a really profound problem because buybacks don't, don't account nicely. They look like a payment. 
from the point of view of the corporation, but they do not look like an income from the point of view of the recipient. From the point of view of the business, they're functionally a dividend, but there's no dividend income to match that with on the other side. They just get mixed up with all the other capital gains that may be happening for other reasons. And I, I think that's it's a really thorny problem, but I think if we are serious about asking the question, who is benefiting from oil company profits, we have to somehow make some accounting for buybacks and capital gains. I have a question to uh, Jamie Galbraith. Uh, my question is related with the issue of whether or not we should measure the stance of monetary policy using the car. And the reason I'm asking about this is because there can be at least two problems. For instance, suppose the Federal Reserve lowers the short-term interest rate, but at the same time, they purchase the long-term bonds in the context of quantitative easing, then how should we, this should be considered as a super you know, easing policy. But somehow, if the short-term interest rate and long-term interest rate went down in, to a similar degree, then this will not be measured as easing policy. Another issue is just think about zero low bound period. Because of zero low bound, but the reserve couldn't do anything other than quantitative easing. So they go and uh, go to the market and purchase the long-term bonds. So that's supposed to be easing, but according to your yield curve measure, this looks like a tightening, right? My last question is, we all agree that the yield curve has two different components. Expectation component, which measures expected future path of the federal funds rate. The second component is, what we call investors' liquidity premium, which is endogenous and time varying. This power of movement has nothing to do with direct intent of monetary policy. So, for these three reasons, I have the difficulty of accepting your yield curve measure as a stance of monetary policy. Could I ask you to repeat the third question there, the third point, because I couldn't quite make out what you were saying. Um, so suppose the world is risk neutral. Everybody is risk neutral. Then it should be exactly the same as expected half of the short-term interest rate. But in reality, do not agree with each other. There's a discrepancy between expected path of the short-term interest rate and the long-term yield. And we think this- I got, I got two out of the three. The third one just isn't coming through. Thanks for trying. Thanks a lot for wonderful presentations. I mean, I learned a lot and they are great. So uh, I guess, uh, you know, I agree with basically uh, concern with using the yield curve. I was just trying to raise that point. That may not be sometimes, you know, uh, the response of the Fed cannot be measured by that. Uh, in relation to that one, there is also an endogeneity issue over there because uh, the Fed is reacting as, you know, uh, uh, basically, Jerry's paper is showing basically, you know, you, uh, that there is a sort of uh, when basically, if if we believe that what we are measuring is correct, then it should affect the outcome. Then the outcome should affect our decision. But that's so. Uh, that's you know, minor issues maybe. I would like to focus on Jerry's paper a bit. Uh, you know, I guess. Um, I have two main uh, concerns or, you know, it, it shows a great picture and then I feel I uh, share the overall sentiment. But first, throughout time overall, I wonder if it's, uh, if it is important to also consider the changing pattern in financial markets because here basically uh, when the Fed interest rate changes, in your case, you are using the Fed effective rate uh, 
yes, as a response function, right? And then you're trying to understand the impact of that one on the wealth. I wonder if, because it basically transmits into wealth through financial markets, because we know that throughout time, uh, the, the, the role of, you know, a lot of uh, financial innovations and the big firms, <laughs> They've increased in financial markets. The regulation changed the structure of financial markets. So as a result of this, this transmission mechanism might have changed significantly, which might have basically changed the relationship between the Fed interest rate and market interest rates significantly, which may change the final outcome that the wealth effect. So I wonder if you are paying attention to that one. I, I have some other questions, but I will stop. Okay, one more, and then we'll let... Thank you. Yeah, really fascinating papers. Thank you. Um, I'm trying to kind of bring together Jerry and Aaron's presentation with our work on, on profit um, explosions and distribution. So it seems like there's some sort of a contradiction because from the, I'm only looking at that one sector that we have looked at, um, it appears that the top 1% are gaining from this kind of profit-driven inflation. Your work seems to show that the top 1% are losing, right? And then they might be losing less if the Fed protects them, if I'm getting your story correctly. So I'm, I'm, I would be interested to understand a bit better um, what, what your data looks like. You have used, I mean, data across all inflations in the last, X, maybe I've missed that during the presentation, but I'm wondering whether there is something going on here where maybe this inflation is a bit different. I mean, we have this like whole di discussion around the question of whether this is a profit explosion inflation and whether this might like lead to different kind of dynamics and whether this might be the factor that kind of can reconcile um, the two findings or whether it's it's something else. So I would be very interested to learn from Aaron and, and Jerry's um, views on that question. Thank you. Okay. I think just go in the order of the presentation. So start with Jamie. So Jamie, you can go ahead and reply first. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Michael, for very um, useful comments. I, um, they, uh, I just have a, a few points in response to the, the uh, comments. First of all, there is a good deal of the when and where is laid out uh, in tables and, and, and figures in the appendix. Uh, and there is some evidence on midterms, which is obviously it's weaker than it is for, uh, for presidential years. So we, we didn't, I didn't want to dwell on it. Uh, so, uh, the, uh, the other thing I, I will come back to just a second on, uh, in response to the questions about the yield curve, uh, I, I, first of all, the, the, the model is estimated over a period that ends up in two, ends in 2006. So it does not cover uh, the period of quantitative easing, uh, and uh, I, I have I'm agnostic about the the, the 15 year interval uh, or 14 15 year interval between 2000 the outbreak of the Great Crisis in 2007 uh, and uh, and and 2020 uh, 2021. As this is uh, just a it, it could well be quite quite a different. Um, a period and and then therefore who knows what the effect is but uh for the period that we are estimating uh, i don't believe there's any significant reason to believe that the long-term interest rate was a serious target of fed policy uh that manipulations of the long-term interest rate of the kind that were being suggested could have had any major effect on the on, on the term structure what we're looking at is a long-term interest rate which moves up and down with the basically with the overall inflationary environment uh it moves the the long-term rates move down from the early late 70s early 1980s onward as the fed pursues various policy various periods of fairly low interest rates and they end up but the term structure as a whole remains quite stable because the short-term rates remain you know they have a certain number of percentage points below the 10-year rate uh i don't believe that there's a significant difference if you use the 20-year rate or some other rate but they, uh, the reality is that the fed's policy is set by the open market committee by targeting uh the, the very short-term rate that's their fundamental instrument and so we consider that we were in, in good shape in 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 using that um and i think that's probably still true for again allowing for the possibility that in a great crisis things may be a little bit different 
Uh, the one other thing I wanted to say, just in response to, 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 to another comment that Michael made, when he said that there, there's nothing wrong with the World Inequality Database, I, I really beg to differ. Um, and I highly recommend, if I might, a, a, a review uh, in development and change uh, on which I authored, and it's open source, so you can find it, uh, and it, you can you can get it by looking at the, for the title, which is scarce, a sparse, inconsistent, and unreliable. Uh, so to, just to, to let you know what I really think, I did a very deep dive on that data set, and I would not recommend. It might be all right for the United States, but I would not recommend using it for comparative purposes. Uh, and that uh, uh, Jerry also already knows. We spoke about the. Uh, the use in his paper of the of the data for uh, the declining share of income uh, in the bottom fifty percent in Piketty's data uh, it, that is an artifact of the very large and increasing numbers of tax filers. Uh, rather than households. There are 90 million tax filers more than households. Uh, and those are very low income people who are not poor. <laughs> they are living with their parents or their young adults living alone. Uh, but they are, uh, this, this, is, this is not the same thing as household income. Uh, and I think Piketty and Saez and Zuckman just didn't understand their data set uh, in, in taking that in. Thank you. So Aaron. Okay, thank you. Um, so the yeah the issue is well taken in terms of of income. I don't know how well it uh, is really a factor in the wealth data that they use, um, or that the wealth data that they generate. Um, so yeah, they are using, and I think there's maybe a misunderstanding of their of their method. They are taking uh, tax filers. Um, as their uh, unit, they're also splitting them up into individuals, and then they're reconciling that data with um, with surveys and with uh, a, a national account. So I think they're they're trying to adjust uh, for those issues. So I, I don't think it's it's um, maybe as big as a problem as as you're making it out to be, but but you might be right. The, the main point is that if you're going to do a time series analysis of this sort, you can't have any gaps in the in the data. On a, you need like a consistent annual time series to do something like this. So uh, maybe the data is so bad we shouldn't uh, use it, but um, like if we're going to do this type of analysis, that's, that's what we have to do. Another methodology that we could use is um, we could actually estimate using LPIV um, the effects on various aspects of, of the economy. So you can look, you can uh, estimate the effect on on equities, on house prices, right, on unemployment, and so forth, and then try to reconcile those effects using, say, the survey of consumer finances, which only right takes a, a survey every three years. So that's another methodology that we've been uh, looking into. We just haven't sort of done it yet. We've been working with these kind of aggregate um, variables that we have. Um, in terms of you know questions about you know what's going on with profits and so forth um it, it's hard to tell it, it, that, that is a limitation of this particular exercise so to get a, a question like that we would have to kind of look at these different components kind of one by one and then take and then sort of apply that in a sort of micro simulation right on um you know existing or, or a survey of existing um kind of balance sheets right with the composition of, of assets and so forth and then see how things are being allocated do that you could do a, a study like that and that's what barcher um at all uh, also do so um that's something that that we're looking into and and hopefully we can uh, address in time um hopefully within uh, this paper but we'll see what happens um another limitation yeah is is uh that i guess i'll address here is is yeah, I don't know how well this this methodology can speak to sort of the supply shocks, right? We can't we're we're estimating an impulse, right, to inflation, but we don't we're not kind of somehow specifying where the inflation is coming from. Is it demand inflation or is it just a, a supply shocks or, or cost push? Um, and so the only way to get at that is to take Michael's recommendation and just sort of look at, at different periods. Um, the uh, problem with this current, uh, you know, data set is that um, because it's annual and because we have a relatively short amount of time, it's hard to restrict observations and get consistent results. So that's something that we have to uh, um, take into account. I did recently learn about um, this uh, a data series that is longer. It, it's a uh, more high frequency, so it's they offer quarterly and monthly, but it's based on the same methodology as right as the. Um, 
uh, world inequality data. data. So um, it, I guess it'd be still subject to the criticism uh, of Jamie here. So, um, but, so that's, those are things we'll have to, to take into account and, uh, and caveat, but uh, that'd be probably the best we can do. Okay. Yep, go ahead. You no, need the mic. Okay, uh, and uh, thank you very much for the comments. Thank you, Ma Michael, and, and the questions. Um, let me first take Michael, Michael's question about, well, what does this say about the hard money view of monetary policy? Uh, the, the combination of the paper we gave here and the other paper I, I referred to, which uh, hopefully Aaron will be giving uh, in Naples, uh, Italy, um, in, in a couple months, is the following. It's, it was the last slide that I said that, yes, there has been a break in the hard money. In fact, um, I gave, a, I gave a, pa a paper in our Bob's uh, my financialization a number of years ago. Inflation is low and under control, then finance would prefer expansionary policy, low interest rates to uh, create gas bubbles and uh, when it has, is it has, then it's complex because on the one hand, raising low stock and bond price um, mostly own. At the same time, it's effective in lowering inflation. It can help preserve the real wealth of, of so We have these two, um, and we're now in the second one. Now, um, uh, so, uh, the, and Isabella basically asked, which is, well, um, there seems to be a question on the one hand, uh, increases in profits that you should be you know, wealthy. Uh, but at the same time, we're claiming that was raising based on the, the, the value of the wealth. Again, it's, um, it's a fallacy composition, my conflict that we're, we're, we're here. So um, think as a bank. Uh, perhaps as the executive committee, the capitalist class will wrote a paper uh, for the executive committee of finance um, in what it is. But um, yeah, individual capitalists would like to raise prices as much as they can to get as much profits as they can, including oil prices. But for the system as a whole, the Fed is looking for the whole, uh, the whole class. So. Um, uh, what, what they would prefer is to have higher prices and low inflation. They can't necessarily get that. So at a certain point, they come in and raise interest rates to preserve the real wealth of, 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 the, of the wealthy. Yeah, so that's the hypothesis. Reconcile these things. It's not, it's in financial. So um, it, the combination of these two papers really do have to take into account various evolution of finance oh. and how they affect the transmission mechanism between interest rates, uh, inflation, and, and wealth. Many th thanks to Michael for this discussion and apologies for sending him a very incomplete presentation. Mm. Um, thank you. And also to the very interesting, stimulating questions. Um, so, Yes, the, I think you answered most of Kate's question and also in a way Michael's uh, point about these different types of inflations that might differently affect um, uh, the distributionary effects. I also want to point out though that we are not looking here at debt, for instance. Uh, we're looking at gains from equity holdings and as Josh perceptive, perceptively observed, um, we're not looking into capital gains, although I'll say more about that in a moment. Um, the one thing that I still wanted to say is, you know, what if the next inflation is due to the destruction of productive capital or whatnot um, because of some major climate disaster, uh, knock on wood? Um, yes, I mean, true, then some profits just disappear and some incomes, uh, more importantly, um, for those that are not fortunate enough to earn profits. But then, you know, if there is a shift towards profits in the um, in the labor profit share, it's even worse because there's a smaller cake to be re redistributed uh, or to be distributed. So that's certainly a, a very important comment there uh, looking forward. Now, um, Josh raised a couple of very interesting questions um, that give me an opportunity to clarify one or two things. 
So we are not looking at the large majority of global oil and, oil and gas profits, uh, even among stock market listed firms. About a quarter of global stock market listed net income uh, goes to uh, United States listed firms. And then after transfers from abroad, it's about one third. And you're rightly worried that not all corporate uh, equities that are owned in US firms are belonging to United States citizens. However, I would say we're actually taking a very conservative approach because the same holds for United States thing, holding those other two thirds of profits abroad. And given the very high wealth of United States residents, that's probably a pretty large share. And I also want to point to uh, Leon Snidikumanas and Jim Boyce's work on um, hidden capital flows that go mostly from not so affluent to affluent countries, uh, which we do not track here, but which might certainly be argued to play a role in, in a commodity sector, um, such as oil and gas. Um, but I'm happy to hear more. You're shaking your head. Um, so, so it's, you know, it's, yeah, the data is hard to come by and it's incomplete and we're making some assumptions. We're trying to be very transparent about that. So that's great to have the conversation. Um, are oil market profits different? Well, yeah, to some extent. I mean, land rent plays actually an important role, I think, or, or if you're more believing these are actually exhaustible resources in any real sense, maybe hoteling price increases. Um, so, but, uh, you know, it, I think every sector is a little different. So, for instance, the fertilizer industry was able to pass through and additionally market uh, their uh, increased input costs. Fertilizers are mostly produced with gas uh, these days, with methane. And But uh, diversified chemicals were not really able to increase their profits very much. And, uh, you know, the United States has, what, 25 trillion in GDP, maybe one third is profit and a wage profit share. So that's what, 8 trillion Net income is, I think, a fraction of that after taxes, depreciation, allowance, and so forth. So maybe three trillion, and we show hundred trillion one quarter, scale it up to three hundred trillion over the years. So it's ten percent of overall profits. That so there is definitely also going back to your point. Uh, yeah, scope to analyze what share of overall profits uh, these are and 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 how different they are from other sectors. Um, national oil companies. Yes, they also make a lot of profit, and we're actually working on a global version of this paper that uses slightly less good data, but uh, we are extracting data from oil field cash flows to estimate what national oil companies might be earning, which is a lot of money, I think, uh, currently, um, but sitting on some of the best reserves in terms of cost competitiveness. Um, and buybacks, well, the dying point here is that the owners ultimately have claim from companies, so it is their money. It's one way of measuring that. But obviously, not that of people, you know, also pensions. It, it's then probably the pension company buys more shares uh, with the profits for the pensioner that may not draw on these for the next. So um, yeah, and so you, you know, we can argue about how that directly affects inflation. But of course, if you're Friedmanite consumption smoother. Bring again, maybe um, especially if you have that kind of amount of money to think about that um, wealth and um, yeah, and so buybacks. Some of the net is used to have share to 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 make shape share buybacks, which inflate the capital um, the marketization of the companies, and so. If the shareholders were wanted to draw on their stocks by selling them in that moment, they would actually probably get more than the net income. But there might, of course, be the next downswing, and they might miss out on these uh, caps. Sorry, my cap. Um, yeah, uh, thank you. Watch the whole panel and uh, the discussion as well. Oh. Oh. We're tight on time, so I'm inclined to just, yeah, Gary's yeah. 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 making an announcement before. Hang on. Uh, you can talk about people trying to be at the intersection of doing academic research and being engaged in the real world. Well, okay, here we got a uh, senior professor at Howard who is also chief economist for the AFL-CIO. So he spends his days fighting for the well-being workers, and he does it from a foundation as a researcher. And there's, I don't know if there's a lot of people you can say that about, but here we have it. Um, 
Now, uh, about a year ago, Bill and I were uh, on an email exchange at Buckner was with us. So, too bad Bob has since left, so that Bob can affirm what I'm about to tell you is true. So, uh, for those who are into financial press, it looks like a lot of us do. Um, there was a persistent uh, rumor, lists of candidates that were going to be filled. Uh, by President Biden for the open reserve. And one of the two or three candidates over and over and over again was going to be appointed to the Fed. Um, Bob Kuttner wrote something about it in his uh, daily blogs about how significant this would be uh, for Bill to be appointed. I myself thought that Bob understated the case uh, I told him so. I said this will actually be transformative to have some of uh, Bill's stature, accomplishments, uh, principle, uh, actually fed. And, and I still uh, went into that. And it's uh, unfortunate that for whatever reasons, uh, Biden uh, got called from. And uh, Bill did not make it onto the Fed, uh, but he's still doing outstanding work at the LCIO and at Howard, and as a commentator, including having just been at the Board of Governors yesterday on uh, a labor perspective on Fed policy. And one of the things that I said, and I think you know part of this part of the email exchange. Uh, well, it was between me and Bob, things I said that I was so excited about the prospect of Bill actually getting onto the Fed was that not only was he an accomplished economist, not only did he represent the side of things, uh, but this was a, a person of uh, deep principles who stood up for uh, what he knew was true and who was not shy about it. And so I, I don't know if you even remember this. I'm going to tell one anecdote about Bill uh, at an ASSA meeting 25 years ago. Uh, yeah, it was in book because it was around NAFTA. So there was a session on NAFTA that uh, I think James Robson was giving his, uh, yeah, yeah, his equilibrium model on how NAFTA was going to. Uh, uh, expand job opportunities, those were just um, implausible. Uh, and uh, Bill was absolutely, I mean, you know, these things are generally polite. Like, ours is fairly polite, I'd say, but it, it, it's, it's, everyone tries to mostly say nice things. Well, Bill actually just laid into Robinson. I've never, I've never seen anything like it. Uh, absolutely insisting that, you know, the, the assumptions you were completely doing this. And you know, uh, and uh, I'm sure the, all of us in the audience knew uh, that this uh, projection as to the benefits of NAFTA for the working people in the United States had no credence whatsoever. At, you know, this was a you know a model that you know the administration was using and so forth. I'll never forget that uh, that this really showed. Uh, not only was someone who knew what he was talking about, but who was willing to stand up for it in, in the most awkward situations. So, yes, had Bill gotten the Fed, we might not even be at this conference right now. Uh, but we're happy to have been the conference and very happy to have you here Bill, to be our last speaker, Ms. Briggs. Thank you so much, Bob. I, I don't know how to even follow that. Uh, <laughs> uh, fortunately, I'm older, so my temper has gotten longer. Uh, I still don't like fools. So <laughs> I think I've become better at handling them, I think. But um, yeah, I think the Fed wouldn't have liked it. So uh, I, I want to thank you and Jerry for putting together a wonderful conference. I do apologize. I couldn't be here yesterday, as you mentioned. Um, 
We had a meeting yesterday, the executive council of the AFL-CIO, 11 of the presidents of our affiliate unions and the president of our Minnesota State Fed who serves on the executive council with President Liz Schuler and Secretary Treasurer Fred Redman. And um, I had organized these in the past when um, Janet Yellen was the chair. Uh, they, they fell off after President Trump had died and we got into the middle of COVID. But the meetings are important because it puts before the governors the actual voices of the real people who have to bargain these agreements. And they got to hear a mouthful um, and uh, so, so I apologized because I had accepted this to be here for two days, but it's so hard to coordinate calendars that um, that meeting had to take precedent, and and it 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 emphasized for the board of governors the deep complexities that we are facing right now, and the rather implausible position that the Fed has taken. Um, and they got to hear it straight from the people who lead America's uh, workers. So I, I want to echo everything that I've heard so far. Um, I am so appreciative that the groundwork for what I'm gonna say has already been laid because I agree with all the papers that have been presented. I just want to crystallize what's been said to give my view of what I think the Fed ought to be doing in this situation. And I obviously think they're not doing that right. So um, I'm going to hark back to, to Bob's presentation yesterday that I missed, and I'm sorry I missed it, but you know he went through a deep analysis of where did this 2% target come from? I wanna take it a, a, a more generic step. So I'm not saying anything different than what he said, except to even ask a question about, did it change? Yes, it did, okay. Um, uh, wh why even price stability? You know, a lot of the argument that, that, that we're, we're, we're fighting against is this idea that Price stability, yes, and then everything else falls into place. That's how it is presented to us. So often in economics, we have been caught up now in you have to show me some identification so you can give me causality. Uh, we've gone deep, 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 deep in that direction. We forget sometimes, no, first you even have to show me correlation. Like, not even the step on the causality, just so me correlation. It's like, well, we can have rising wages and we can have rising living standards with no unions. Okay, so show me a correlation, not causation, just correlation. Show me a place with low union density, no bargaining power, and rising wages and rising living standards. Well, you know, you can say, well, unions don't cause that, but you can't show me the counterfactual. There's no correlation that holds that up, right? So sometimes we have gotten too far on the way end of forgetting that you got to show me correlation. So why price stability? Uh, so we can see before the great moderation that there was greater variation in prices that inflation was slightly higher during that period that we didn't have tight monitoring of, of price variation. And we can show that yes, this is price moderation in that we have slightly lower inflation and there's much less variation in it. Okay, these are the two time periods. So what is it correlated with? Does it go with something good? Whether it's cause or not, just does it go with something good? Well, here we have labor market stability, and we can see that, in fact, uh, unemployment averages much higher, that the variation in unemployment is slightly bigger, and we have spent many more months, a much higher share of months, um, a, that were above 6%. I have it in the good sense, you know, were you below 6%? 
but we have spent far less time below 6% under this price moderation. So not an argument about causality, but just the correlation, the argument that price stability gets me something better for workers. Okay, but that's not correlated with getting something better for workers. So this isn't telling me that price stability is all that in a bag of chips, because that's not how it's turned out. We do know that that higher unemployment rate and the greater variation and the less time that we have spent anywhere near what you might call full employment is correlated with this, this gap between what do workers make and what do they produce? It is correlated with that. Again, not causation, but the simple, it is correlated with that. And greater price variation, less price stability, is correlated with prices rising with productivity. So tell me that price stability is nirvana just doesn't work out. It's not the way it works. What happens with this problem we've had when we are worried about price stability and this gap that is associated with workers not seeing their wages rise with productivity. Now, part of that you saw from Jay's paper, part of this we all know is you have fewer unions, you have lower minimum wages, and there are a whole other set of attacks on workers that we can list, I would argue, because they are more possible when you have higher unemployment. When you have workers sitting out desperate for jobs, all of those things are possible. It is easier to attack a union. It is easier to say, if you go on strike, I will permanently replace you if the unemployment rate is 10%. It is easier for workers to say, yes, you have not raised the minimum wage in 20 years, but I'll take the job anyway. It is easier to do all that when you put workers under the pressure. There are no jobs. Jobs will be scarce. These are easier to accomplish. So there are other things, so again, the issue about causation, but there are other things correlated with higher unemployment that make these other things possible, but what else is possible? And how do we keep the economy together is the question we often don't ask. So workers weren't making more money, they were making more stuff, so why weren't they unemployed? Say is law, right? You, you got to go buy the stuff in order to have the jobs. So the red line is the growth of consumer debt. That blue line, it's on the other axis, but you can see they grow together. The blue line is the gap. So there you have it. If you're making more stuff, but you're not making more money, it means you must be borrowing to buy the stuff. That's just how it has to work. That's just the arithmetic in order to keep everybody employed. And so it seems to be that that tracks the growth of finance and insurance and value added in GDP as well. Somebody borrowing money is somebody's wealth, which means that some industry has to handle all of this and presto, it's getting bigger. It's all correlated. And then let's look at that gap in productivity. That's the, the, the blue and red graph is the productivity wage gap. But this other graph is fascinating because that's the gap between wages in the financial sector and everybody else. So again, not causation, but it's clearly correlated that that gap generates debt, generates wealth for somebody else, generates an industry where a lot of people are getting a lot of money if they're in the 1% in that industry. How does the Fed then pretend that interest rates matter? Because now it matters for consumption because this is how people are consuming. They're consuming off the debt. We get this one little bright moment, people have savings and 
debt has fallen to a record low level, delinquencies on credit cards is record low level, delinquencies on all debts are record low levels. We're actually at the economy you would want. Complaint, complaint, complaint. Larry Summers is complaining. Oh, people have too much money. Jason Furman is complaining. You gave people too much money. They have too much savings. They're making too much money. Oh my goodness, they're not going into debt. Who, after two years where we destroyed the labor market, took away people's income, would complain that two years later, you return to the same share of employment to population ratio, higher wages, fewer people in low wage jobs, lowest level of household debt, who then complains? Why is this bad? Who could say this is bad? We've never had a return to normalcy from a worker's perspective in two years. It never happened. Normalcy in a better sense because actually now households are where you would want them to be in the first place to be resilient. They have the savings, they have better liquidity, but we got the complaints. Um, the problem with this giant increase in inequality is that it creates a less stable economy. When you have greater inequality, you have less stability. So the correlation of price stability with things is not two good things, higher inequality which is correlated with less economic stability, which is correlated with greater debt, which is correlated with workers living with wages that don't sustain the economy. So why do we want price stability? I mean, I'm with Bob, why do you want 2% inflation as a target, but why do you want it anyway? What is it that it's correlated with that you can tell me something good happened? Now, the other problem is prices aren't well predicted. I'm taking this from um, some work that uh, Kristen Forbes did. And what she has charted out is this path of the great moderation. And she's looking at the issue of whether the economy runs too hot, just right, or too cold. And you can see that since the Great Recession, our problem has been much more towards too cold and that prior to the Great Recession, we were going towards the just right, almost too cold, but clearly we're in this too cold. Now we have this phase where prices suddenly are high, but she also asked this other question, which is how well do central banks get these targets? And so she's charted out how often they've let their economy be too hot, which includes this before the great moderation. Since the great moderation, look at the share of central banks that tend to get the economy wrong because of shocks. Often they do let the economy overheat. We see a couple of spells of that. But the biggest thing they do is they get it wrong. The economy is too cool. And the cost of it being too cool are exceedingly high. Now, again, this is just their framework. The other problem they have is this, and that is increasingly we are in a global world. The shocks aren't just to one economy. They are global phenomena. And what happens is a shock that then reverberates through every economy. So I was really happy about your paper because the biggest thing that has made me just go bonkers. I'm a big science fiction fan. So, you know, all those science fiction movies where the aliens come to attack Earth and it's aliens, not these xenophobic Nazis. 
who complain about people from other countries, aliens to earth, come to attack human beings, us as human beings. And in the movie, it's us human beings who have to come to the challenge and realize that we're all on this one little dot in the universe and we have to pull together. And so here we get a virus, which technically is not a living being, which is attacking all human beings, all human beings all around the globe. This is a one moment you think where we would go, yes, because we're not talking about killing somebody because it's a virus, it's a thing. We only have to unite on killing a thing to prevent it from killing us. Could we do it? No, <laughs> we utterly failed. But economists failed bigger than anybody else, in my estimation. Why? Because it is an actual war. And we willingly kind of took a back step to the health experts thank goodness, because economists would have gotten it wrong. And we said, we can't meet in big groups like this. This is not safe. And so we let the health experts tell us, restaurants, getting together, no. Going to a concert, no. Going to the gym, no. Great, hooray. And one thing we economists did was show that saved lives. We saved lives, just as if you're in a war, you have to save lives. What we did not do is say, so you are deliberately constrained to me. You are saying you cannot go to the mall, but you can go to Amazon. You cannot go to a sit-down restaurant, but you can order the pizza you were always ordering online. You cannot go to the gym, but you can buy a Peloton in your house. And no economist stepped in and said, you know, this is just like a war. Because we were also saying, we don't have enough respiratory devices. We don't have enough ventilators. We don't have enough masks. We don't, and we went through all the things under a war production you would have to have. And instead of economists saying, this is a war, and what did we do in World War II? We understood we're blowing up the market. We don't want the market. This is the wrong time to want the market because the market is gonna go bazooka crazy and we can't control it. And you're gonna get all sorts of weird effects because this is a moment we want to direct the market. We want to reallocate people quickly. We can't wait for the market to reallocate people to make masks. We can't wait for the market to reallocate people to make ventilators. We can't wait for the market to deliver us nursing. We didn't say, you're about to deplete our entire nursing workforce. If it's war, right, you know, Unfortunately, you're going to run out of soldiers. You got to draft some people and you're going to have to train them so they can go to war. What do we say? Well, yeah, nurses are getting really sick. Yeah, they're getting the virus at a disproportionate rate. Yeah, they're dying at a really high rate. That was our reaction. No economist stepped in and said, let's get the corollaries here. You need more troops. You have to be figuring out how to train the troops. You need to ramp this up now, not five years as it might take the market to react. Now the market is reacting because after you killed all the nurses, after you ran them all out, we don't have any nurses. There's a nursing shortage. We don't have this conversation. It's horrible. Like somebody with three ounces of common sense couldn't have seen this. An economist of all who think that they know everything couldn't have seen this is going to be an issue. You cannot rely on the market. And, oh, you mean the 
price of Pelotons are going up. This, I don't know, we're talking about this. If you wrote an Econ 1 exam, right? And you said, you cannot go to the gym. No one can go to the gym. What will happen to the price of Pelotons, right? Or one of your students said, nothing. What does that have, what does that have to do when you closed every gym in the country? How is that related to Pelotons? You would go, ooh, right? And then after we get out of that, people want more goods than services. Really? Uh, you're shocked. Now, it, it really was a war. We lost one million Americans. Understand in World War II, we did not lose one million soldiers in a five-year battle against the two most powerful armies we have seen at that point to history. We didn't lose one million of them. We lost one million Americans, one million. And it's counting bigger as we continue to ignore, we are still in a war against this virus. We, the war isn't, I mean, I know the president took a victory lap and said that it's behind us, but people are still getting sick and people are still dying. It may be at a rate we've now normalized, unfortunately, because we've lost our vision that this is humans versus a virus. And for whatever reason, we don't have the patience. This has not been five years. We fought Nazi Germany for five years. Have mercy if these people were in charge in 1941. Oh, we haven't beat Hitler yet. Well, I guess we've got to go home. I'm out. You know, what did we do to markets, though? We understood you cannot just let prices go wherever they want to go because we are deliberately in the need of directing the market. We need to have wage price controls. We need to have a board. This is what the lesson from World War II was. The lesson to the central bank at the time was stand down. We are in a war. The point is we win the war. You worry about anything else later because if we don't win the war, whatever it is you're doing is irrelevant. Now, in the midst of the war against the virus, which we haven't won, we're still fighting it. It is still causing disruptions. We still have more sick days today than we did pre-COVID. And again, people are still dying. So we should never lose track of that. On top of that, Russia decides it wants to flex its muscle and Putin wants to declare himself dictator of the universe and invades Ukraine. The world eats two major grains, wheat and rice. The three major wheat producers, the United States of America, Russia, Ukraine. You're going to take two of the biggest wheat producers out, and then you are going to say, oh, food price is going to stay constant. Like, on what planet? I mean, again, this is an econ one question. If you say to your students, Saudi Arabia is not producing any more oil, Israel is not producing oil, Nigeria is not producing oil, what will happen to the price of oil? And if the answer is, I don't know, it's like, look. Now, in response to taking the Ukraine out, and again, the Fed makes me ballistic, uh, the biggest statistical agency in the United States is the U.S. Department of Agriculture. I was really shocked when I was in the government this because I sat on this committee with all the other assistant secretaries for policy. We were talking about our statistical agencies, and I was just dumbfounded that the statistical agency at agriculture dwarfs the Census Bureau plus the BLS. Dwarfs them. They're tiny little things. They're like an office in the USDA. USDA puts out a very detailed report on world agricultural production. Very detailed. 
So if you look at their last report, they have satellite pictures. This is how serious they are. They have satellite pictures of Ukrainian farms to supplement how they can estimate what's happening to wheat production in Ukraine. That's how serious this statistical agency takes its stuff. Now, how did we survive as it was? Turns out, because wheat is so important to human consumption, we took away acres under cultivation in other grains in order to get wheat production up. So the response from farmers was rather quickly, price of wheat is going up, I'm not growing barley, I'm not growing alfalfa, I'm growing wheat. But the reason I wasn't growing wheat on that land is because the yield is going to be lower, which is why I'm growing alfalfa and barley. So we got wheat production to not fall, you look up on miracle, but only through lower yield land which means the price of wheat is still going to go up because it's less productive land making up for the loss in Ukraine. But what do we do with alfalfa? What is, where do these other greens go? They go to animals. So again, in kind of one, we are growing less hay and alfalfa and oats. What's going to happen to the price of meat? Uh, and then we don't get to have a discussion about global warming, which also affected yield rates, even among lands that were the most productive for wheat. And what is global warming doing? Well, there's a huge drought and this country called China. And if you have a drought, rice needs water. Those two don't go together. So grain production, rice production in China has been falling. Then we had a tremendous typhoon that attacked Pakistan, which grows rice. Now rice needs water, but it doesn't need typhoons. And so rice production was down. And so this year we actually had a drop in grain production. These are huge disruptions. The war, an ability to discuss global warming, an ability to discuss other disruptions. This is why Isabella's paper is so key for my thinking. Going forward, we are enduring right now what global warming threats are, they are real. We are experiencing them now. But we economists are so hung up and prices go up, this has to be labeled inflation. So then we have to talk about inflation. Okay, Mrs. Lincoln, but what did you think of the play? How are we discussing anything other than you're still losing people to the pandemic. We still have this horrible war and we have global warming and it's real. The Mississippi River is drying up. Literally drying up. Parts of it are not navigable. Unless something changes very quickly, large part, larger parts of it will be non-navigable. How do you get the grain from the United States to the world? The Mississippi River. We can't put rail cars to do that because they aren't doing that. The trains that go from Wyoming East are carrying coal. They're not prepared to pick up all that wheat, all that corn. We aren't prepared for Europe to have no corn production. Temperatures above 90 degrees kill corn. It's a self-fertilizing plant from its tassels. Temperatures go above 90 degrees. That fertilization doesn't happen. The pictures that they had in the World Report just showed you these shriveled up ears of corn uh, in Europe from that heat wave. Another heat wave, another spell of no corn. We have to take these challenges seriously. 
we really could not produce chips. We couldn't put them in our cars. We literally warehoused tens of thousands of cars in Detroit because they were waiting for chips. We explained to the Federal Reserve from our utilities unions, another hurricane happens, we have a big problem because we literally don't have poles, the poles for the utilities. We don't have them, they're in shortage. This is a global problem, there are no poles. Transformers, yeah, let me wrap up. Transformers right now, because the, the Russians are attacking the electric grid for the Ukraine, transformers don't exist. Another storm, and we're literally in the United States going to be, while well, some of you aren't going to get your electricity for well, quite a while. Because it's going to take us time to get the transformers or the poles. We're going to have to pick and choose who gets electricity. All of this to say, in this world of uncertainty, why would you want to stabilize prices when you know you can't? Why would you want to do something you know you can't do? And why would you want to tell industries the solution for this is we want price stability, and that means I want to kill demand. So what I want to say to the utility companies right now, you don't have poles, you don't have transformers, so my solution for you you don't have demand. Solved it for you. Nobody's getting the electricity because they don't want to demand it. So now you don't have to worry about the poles. You don't have to worry about the transformers. Done. This is the wrong solution. And so, to me, it is far better for the Fed to say to people, and industry, you have a challenge ahead of you. You're going to have to figure it out. It's not going to be an easy road. And we want you to do it so that we have a green economy coming out of it. You need to be able to make investments to make the green economy happen because we don't have any more time. We can't go without food. That's real now. The threat to food is now. Not 10 years in, as like environment vendors want to tell you you're going to become nothing but cockroaches on the earth. Now, we can't produce food for human beings because of global warming and our stupidity of fighting each other. So we, we, we have to have an emergency plan. We, as economists, have to tell people markets cannot distribute goods if you're going to blow up markets. Do not think that prices are going to be okay. We cannot be. By definition, the way the market allocates goods, prices are going to get bid up. Rich countries will bid against poor countries in order to get these resources. This is happening now. This is not way forward. So we want you to have solutions. But how do I assure? <laughs> how how do I assure that? I assure it by assuring you that I am keeping to full employment. I want workers reallocated. The market can do that at full employment. It really can't do that if you disrupt markets with unemployment. I will monitor prices, but I can't control those. And using demand to shrink the economy gets in the way of us adapting. And we're going to have to have controls against speculation and food and options markets, against fuel and options markets. We will have to monitor against price gouging, just like you would if there were a hurricane. Just like you would if somebody wiped out Southern Florida, we don't let people price gouge on water, we don't let them price gouge on food, we can't let that happen. We economists have to lead. We have to provide the world with no, there's no Santa Claus, there's no fairy tale land. If you disrupt markets and you continue to want to believe in markets, they're going to give you answers you don't like. We're going to give you high prices in all sorts of places, and we can't predict all of them, and there's no way for us to monitor all of them. You're going to get how prices grow up. Let us at least help people who need the help 
those who have low incomes who won't be able to navigate us, we need the fiscal space to do that. And we're going to allow the fiscal space so you can help the people who are hurt by these high prices. We're going to allow companies with the liquidity so that you can find the other resources, so you can invest in making sure supply chains are going to be there. And we're going to do that by assuring that the one time you can count on, you can't count on prices, but you can count on, we're going to make sure everybody is working to these solutions. Because we need all hands on deck, everybody is valuable in this war against climate, against evil, and against this stupid virus. Thank you. And thank you so much, Bill. That was really great. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question that I think I've been thinking about the last a lot the last couple of days is that people care about inflation. So you ask why price stability, and I agree with you on substance, but we know people really care a lot about inflation. I'm thinking of the Bob Schiller paper that I think Josh Bivens brought up a year ago, and I now talk about in casual conversation once a week, that like people just, they do care a lot. And I think, you know, this is partly prices seem like they just come from above and it's an injustice when they go up a lot versus if you lose your job, even in a recession, or if you have low wages, even under monopsony, you can internalize that a little bit more. And so how do we change that attitude? Do we need to change that attitude? Maybe the Fed just acts on the principle of full employment anyway, and that can lead that change in attitude. I just think that's like a big constraint to a lot of what everyone has been talking about mm -hmm. the past two days is that people care. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for a fantastic talk. Um, we clearly share a vision, so how to get there? <laughs> that is my question, how to get there? And what to do politically? Like if, if this is the scenario, what, I mean, what is to be done? Anybody else have a question or a comment? Okay, it gets back to you, Bill. Oh, this is where- So we are involved. Mm -hmm. So Bill, of course, and then we'll everybody can contribute. So this is why I'm angry at the Fed because the, their ability as as being given all mantle of you are independent economic thinkers is is their biggest role is to educate people. Which in August of 2020, and then and then his speech. Uh, to to the the, the Fed uh, at at Grand Teton Lodge. That's what Jay Powell did. He explained this scenario to people, but instead, he, in my view, was bullied by the people that um, Jamie identified uh, into being defensive. Why? why should one believe that I can't get chips for three months is the end of transitory? Just because we haven't experienced a disruption in production that is long-term doesn't mean that's not possible. And he, Jay, in my view, let himself be bullied away from transitory and being told, well, transitory has to be three weeks. You know, it's more than three weeks. But yes, we had a strike against General Motors. General Motors forced a strike on the UAW in October of 2019 before COVID. I have to explain that to you if you look at a map, if you look at a graph of US auto production, because you see it dip just a little bit and you're like, why did it dip a little bit? That was the strike. If I show you we didn't have chips in any auto factory, you, it's down here. Yeah, I don't have to explain it to you. You know, it was there. And it was there for many months. We, we as economists have to do a better job. It's the expectations, I think, Kay. It's the expectations, and it's the way you explain it to people. Because suddenly you had the Fed 
in the vaunted Larry's somewhere telling everybody it's because you got too much money because there was too much from the federal government and all this kind of stuff. And so their expectation was, this is something you can do about. You can do it now. You have the power of Federal Reserve to control this. And you didn't have the strong voice from the Fed saying, folks, this needs some calm level thinking. We can't control the drought in China. We can't lower temperatures in Europe. We can't solve the drought for our farmers. If we have these supply shocks, prices will go up. It's tempering expectations. The Fed talks about expectations all the time, but they have to temper these expectations and they have to help us understand what are real solutions. So of course I'm gonna be upset if you tell me, there's that Joe Biden, it's that Federal Reserve, they printed all that money in 2020, it was quantitative easing, all of that, that's why the price of corn is high. And so of course people are gonna be upset. I'd be upset too. I'm not upset about the prices, but when you say those things, you preclude when you say it's demand, as Larry Summers has pointed out, those of us who say, well, why don't we index SNAP benefits? Understanding that we're gonna have this crisis for a little while, why don't we raise SNAP benefits because we know it's reaching deeper into the wage distribution of those who can adjust to these food prices and we're gonna index them so that they will cover the food prices, you can't do it because now everybody and everybody in Congress, believe me, you know this because you're there. If you propose that to Congress right now, you get, you get the usual votes from our usual progressive friends and nobody else would agree with you. And they would even be afraid of bringing it up because they know they'd be laughed out the room. This is the problem. So these shots, we have to have the fist that we accept that you got to have fiscal space to respond when there's a hurricane that wipes out you know, 30 cities in Florida. We don't think they're going to magically rebuild, but people think they're going to come and start rebuilding. And so my answer is, you show people that you get it. This is pain. We do know how to relieve that pain. We do know how to get households the money so that they can navigate this. They wanted to deal with this contradiction between the European Central Bank saying it wanted to tighten demand, but at the same time, they were quite aggressive about how do we get fuel subsidies in Germany, this complex formula of how we can help families negotiate these fuel prices, and how can we help lower income families with food? We couldn't do that in the US because that was off limits. All the criticism was that more demand that will raise inflation because we're still calling this inflation and we're still unwilling to get everybody on board and unify us in purpose. It's amazing we still can't unify the American people in the face of COVID and every American who's over 50 knows to hate Russia instinctively. And, and we can't unite Americans against these two things speaks volumes to, to, to us. But as economists, this ought to be one thing where we can contribute to uniting people and uniting people against global warming and saying, we're serious, you gotta fight global warming. The threat is now to us having food. And economists are still off debating This is inflationary, and the way to control inflation is, is it demand, is it supply? We still are, it's, we can't get to a world level standing, and it's frightening because it's a world level standing in the case of global warming and the virus. This is not go out and kill humans. 
Let's just go out and unify humans. And, and we economists still, we're so atomistic in our training that we can't join humans together. We can't give a lesson on human unity in the face of what now are true existential threats to humans, not Americans, not Russians, not Ukrainians, to humans. All right. Oh, did you have a question? Okay. I think we might have two questions. So I, I really liked what you were saying earlier about inequality inflation. Mm -hmm. And Robert Frank and others have advanced this idea of a progressive consumption tax as an alternative to raising interest rates and using the, that um, fiscal space uh, to help meet needs for necessities. Yet I haven't seen much take up or much discussion of that idea. Is that what's what's happening with that? Is that something that could fly? Before you answer that, we have one final, final question. And, and, yeah. Um, hi, uh, Mark Satterfield from the New School. Um, I, I just want to pick up on the people care about inflation topic. Um, I mean, it seems to me that they do, but in a textbook sense, inflation is an equal proportional rise in all prices. In a practical case, it never is. It's a messy series of relative price changes. So to sort of paraphrase a former president, it's the redistribution stupid. Um, so on that basis, it seems to me that democratic policymakers could and should have owned the environment over the, uh, the, the last year or two. Uh, because it's the redistribution stupid, not inflation per se. So I'm wondering if you have any insights as to why they haven't, why they've actually, if anything, run away from it instead of run, run toward the issue by reframing it for what it is in terms of essentially redistribution that is adverse to labor rather than a textbook inflation. Well, and, and answer that question in fairness, um, a very progressive and Green Act went through the House. They didn't shy away from it. But for one politician in the Senate, they would have gotten the bigger vision. And they were selling the bigger vision of why we needed to act now, why we needed the bigger investment that was asked for in the House legislation. And they were leading with that. And so it's the unfortunate way that it played out, but it played out in large part because it was within the context of all these economists yelling and screaming about inflation and this huge government program in the face of inflation with a stupid idea because it would make inflation worse. So this characterization from folks who were characterizing this moment as being driven by excess demand kills fiscal space and kills the ability to, to move the debate. And many people were therefore convinced that that act, rather than move us to the right point, was moving inflation up. And instead of thinking this is going to help us get food prices under control, they thought the other. And, and Nancy, I, I mean, that... That was something I proposed, and even Larry Summers said, yes, maybe the, after he realized he wasn't making sense, um, said, yes, we should probably do that. I mean, the, the goal of Larry and Jason was they pointed to what the fiscal policy was and ignored that the stock market had gone up enough to generate trillions of dollars to the top 5%, from accumulated wealth, that was not inflationary. Giving a child credit to some working mom, that's inflationary. So, I mean, there was a reality in, you know, the paper on where does the oil surplus wealth go? To the top. So yes, there's every argument to say, if you want to make this move, Fit from a fiscal policy position. If you want to say, okay, I get it, but we still don't want demand to go crazy, then yes, most of the consumption in the United States happens at the top. 
the reality is that the top 10% consume as much as the bottom 40%. So if, if, if you're worried about this, the income gains that we have seen go to the top, much of this is from profiteering, from being able to price gouge. Where do those profits go? Whether it's oil and, you know, the paper certainly suggested it, whether it's oil or something else, it goes to the wealthy. Um, then yes, you, you, if you worry about the fiscal fairness of it and you don't want to exacerbate things, in this moment, we should have a surcharge just as we did with creating the income tax to do World War I and the surcharge we did to do World War II. We are in a war. Humans are in a war. People at the top who are gaining as they gained in World War II because there are people who made mints mints of money providing the armaments you gotta pay a tax for that we gave you well by fiat we gave you well by fiat we're giving them wealth because we're not reigning in their excesses knowing that these shortages create huge opportunities for profiteering and so yeah i think that you could say let's tax it but let's not put the onus on the fed to kill the economy if you're that worried about the excess demand, it's the people at the top. All right. Thank you so much, Bill. Didn't disappoint. Um, too bad you believe it on the phone, right? <laughs> God, I think it would have actually truly been transformative if that one little thing had happened. And it didn't. So we still have to fight the battle. And it'll take five minutes and I will focus on what is to be done. Okay. Everybody has to have some answers. We want them. Job. <laughs>
uh, Nicole, where is Nicole? Uh, okay, when she comes back, we'll, and then Kim, thank you very much, Kim. So yeah, I guess they're twofold. Uh, what is to be done? And yeah, I knew, I actually knew it was from Lynn. Uh, that was on purpose. <laughs> uh, um, so uh, uh, what is to be done? What is to be done with the papers and discussion that you've come out with? And then what is to be done in the world? Um, I want to just make a couple of uh, preliminary comments in reference to some of the things that came out. Um, I guess abusing my role now is uh, having the mic. Uh, one thing, again, you know, it's too bad Bob Kuttner left, I uh, believe. Um, uh, one of the things I wanted to address when he raised um, yesterday, the idea, uh, and, and of course, there's a lot of merit to it, the idea that, you know, let's jump ahead 2032, and we're in this uh, decline see and what their shortages and prices uh, are uh, increasing um, forth. Uh, I was really glad that uh, Bill just mentioned the Build Back Better program that was introduced initially by Bernie Sanders. Uh, water on by Biden this big uh, didn't make it because of Senator Manchin. Uh, the alternative way to think about the climate issue is if we're really serious about the um, transformation, uh, the prices of energy are not going to go up. They're going to go down. Uh, right now, renewable energy is to fossil fuels for generating a kilowatt of electricity. And that way you can do investments in energy efficiency, which would further lower uh, the extent of the and spend money on energy. And in addition, we would, of course, have the benefit of not having volatility associated with oil prices uh, and have a much more um, widely distributed source of energy sources. So I just wanted to contradict Bob a little bit on that one, or at least recognize another uh, consideration. Um, I also want to. Uh, uh, on what Jay said, uh, you know, on uh, indexing uh, this to productivity and inflation. Um, fabulous. Um, and I've been just doing this calculation program and just when I give talks, I already drop the number. So uh, what would be minimum wage supervisors today we started if we indexed uh the minimum wage in terms to product inflation in 1973 when you know when, uh, we actually had a peak of real wages so what's your guess one want to guess 60 Right, it would be sixty-one dollars an hour. That's what it would be, uh, and the, and the minimum wage. If we did the same thing with minimum wage, it would be I think twenty-six uh, or twenty-seven. So it would also it would be a different world. That so you are describing. Uh, so that's just another uh, point of reference. And so I'm with slightly disagree with my revered colleague and friend, Nancy Fulbright. Uh, in that well, we can't worry about, you know, people say you can't worry about the care economy because that's just about social justice, but we need to think about it in terms of labor supply and macro, but I think we should, well, yeah, okay, fair enough. That was my, that was my point. Uh, so uh, I'll end on that one. Um, those were my only introduction. Thanks, Bob. So I, I have one um, one point I wanted to make about this. So first of all, I have an enormous amount from all of you uh, about the uh, sectoral 
bottom up, we call them even micro issues in, in this kind of inflation. And I very much welcome the, the shift in focus seems to be emerging from, from this conference away from uh, on inflation. So that's been really edifying for me. However, I think we can throw out macro entirely. It's just, um, I've invested a lot of years. It is just because, I, no, it's not just because. I, I it also gets back to Bob's point at the very beginning um, and Kate's point here. Uh, you can't just ignore uh, an appropriate macro framework for uh, dealing with um, these aggregate phenomena. Um, inflation, unemployment, and so forth. So I think about it, by the way, I'd like to start thinking about it. all I've learned from, from you uh, these last couple of days is what is the appropriate macro framework for thinking about how the macro economy and the forces of uh, inflation increases are what we identify here. It's not that you don't need a macro framework, you probably we will we need a different kind of macro and a different kind of monetary policy and fiscal policy framework. So um, that's uh, one year for for macro. What and I think for the micro forces you we've been talking about today. So uh, I'm not sure of what is to be done with the papers and yeah. You want to go ahead. Okay. So uh, it would be great to have a beautiful book with all papers after everybody's got their final version and they're completely happy and we give them to the publisher and the book comes out three years later. Uh, so you know, there's there's reasons to do such things, uh, to put in your record, but it's going to much more quickly than that. So it's uh, a general, basically, versions of your presentations and, um, and just came here by the way who manages our website so uh, and she makes everything look beautiful these are very big so and basically just put things out on the website and give it some kind of special you can do that can we get you do it but some kind of you know special designation and then maybe promote it and then but in ways that we normally don't give uh, uh, as much attention to as we probably should. So that was one thing. Uh, I was talking uh, again, too bad about Cutner left because he, you know, of all of us, he's the only working journalist and very prominent one. So he was talking about um, his own journal, American Prospect, putting out, you know, a series of papers that they would obviously have to be far less technical than most of the ones that we presented. That was be one thing that he talked about. He also talked about maybe uh, organize, having, getting some hearings organized uh, in Congress. And he, so who knows what will what'll happen with that. But he also, the third thing he mentioned and this is really more for people who are at the EPI and CAP would be to have a variant of what we just did, but again, maybe you know, more to the realm of where policymakers uh, relate and, and in Washington people have low attention spans, so it wouldn't be two days, it would maybe be one day. I don't know if Josh, you, you can speak to that, you know, um, and, um, Mark and yeah, so uh, those were those are the ideas that uh, you know that I've been discussing. I, you know, do you want to add? Yeah. So, um, in terms of the the papers, we would like everybody who presented to send us um, a clean version of your paper um, by. No. <laughs> Should we say the end of February? Is that too late? Yeah, well, let's hear what people think. Yeah, well, when well, uh, sometime in February, I think would be uh, the the what is this, or maybe even sometime in January, so that we can get these things up because it's so timely. Um, and Jamie Garba said that um, inflation is going to be over in a month or so, which uh, I was originally forecasting, but I don't no, any longer believe. But um, yeah, we will, so we're going to send Bob and I'll send out a deadline. It'll be fairly soon, but long enough 
not to drive everybody crazy. Um, but then what we want to do is turn over the, the floor to you all with your suggestions um, about where to go from here, uh, what, what is to be done, um, and how we can really get this, as Eileen Applebaum was urging us to do, really on the top of an agenda of, of policymakers. So let's um, let's turn it over to you, uh, Anamika, who thank you for uh, handling the uh, questions today. I was going to use this. Okay. okay, please raise your hand. Yeah, Bob and Joe, I'm an interloper, so don't, you know you don't have to pay any attention to anything I say. But this is just in the spirit of joining the dots. There was a similar uh, workshop uh, to this at um, the CEPN at Paris 13 or whatever they're calling it. Uh, and there's some great work being done there by uh, Sebastian Charles, Jonathan Marie. It's it's very much euro focused and it's very policy oriented. But as I say, there may be some sort of joining the dots that would be worth exploring with what that group is doing. Uh, as we were talking briefly with uh, uh, Bob Cartner this morning, I think the idea of uh, having an event jointly sponsored, perhaps by you know EPI, CAP, WCG, would be great. I think that if we could get um, the web these papers on the website uh, early in a, you know in advance of that event, it would be a really great way to promote those things together. Um, the idea of trying to arrange a congressional hearing, especially good, and if we could get um, uh, sympathetic testimony from someone at the Fed. Uh, although the bureaucratic obstacles to that are always uh, significant, uh, it would be an enormous step in drawing attention to the debate about this uh, and potentially giving support uh, to uh, Powell, assuming that the notion that he's been bullied away from this uh, is accurate. Um, so I, I think, uh, you know, in the short term, those things together could be really powerful. And, and, you know, we'll do everything we can to uh, collaborate on that. Thank you. Um, so in, addressing the question, the, what is to be done? Um, I, I think that, I mean, there is some consensus in this room, but certainly not outside this room. Um, the, the let's say the source and the propagation mechanisms of uh, the current inflationary moment uh, are not due to wages. So what people typically would say, uh, let's say on the left, is that the big task now is to uh, increase bargaining power such that uh, wages can keep keep up with uh, prices. And I, on one end, I do agree with this. On the other end, as I mean. Other presenters uh, pointed out uh, people are very much concerned uh, with increasing inflation. So, um, in terms of public narrative, it's very I find very difficult anytime I try to address this in public discussion, especially in Portugal, to say, well, we are going to put more pressure on one side of the costs. So, obviously, what I try to say is that okay, we are trying, we are putting pressure exactly on the cost that they are not causing this and on the top of it because bargaining power is low we don't have this kind of acceleration you know feedback mechanisms that typically an IRT is afraid so we can do it without being afraid but again it's very hard to swallow in terms of public narrative uh, especially because I mean th the hegemonic view is, is not is one uh, just on the top of this, just a, a quick point that is, of course, we are saying that we can do this because, in fact, the bargaining power of uh, workers is very low. So we can kind of push uh, for labor strength without being afraid of having this kind of, you know, uh, inflationary moment, kind of the 70s, you know, with crisis of profitability and so on. But uh, th that creates a question that is, if you want to create an institutional setting in which bargaining power is high, then what will happen in the future with this kind of cost-led uh, inflation probably will lead 
more easily to prices trying to catch with prices, and then you'll reach more easily the kind of the limits uh, of social democracy or the limits of the, a mixed economy. So, so. Um, so I wanted to share one thought on kind of the discursive question or where where all of this sits and how it hangs together. It strikes me that broadly speaking, there are kind of three camps in this whole debate. There's of course like the Larry Summers, let's rate hike interest rates, which for our, all of us in this room seems to be the clear enemy. And then there's kind of the camp transitory, which is more like, let's be patient. Let's wait for inflation to pass. Um, let's maybe not worry so much about inflation. Let's maybe discursively try to not focus so much on inflation and stress other kind of issues. And then there's kind of the third camp, um, which is saying, well, inflation is a serious is issue, but it comes from different kinds of dynamics. So we have to do something differently about it. And I see some tension between like kind of this idea of inflation is transitory. So therefore, maybe we do not primarily need to talk about inflation. Let's just talk about shocks. Let's just talk about specific price issues. Let's just talk about the material issues that underlie this. Or um, is it and that relates to to Jerry's point of like the micro being related with the macro. So I happen to be of the opinion that these price shocks, if they are let alone, have the potential to create generalized inflation, which then raises a very severe macro kind of issue and raises the question of what are you going to do? I mean, at the point when, when let's say oil prices have been flowed and have percolated through the whole system and oil prices have gone up, um, then doing something about the oil price is not no longer going to be enough to kind of create a certain level of price stability. And we can debate of what that level should be and so on, but we also probably all agree that we don't want to have hyperinflation. Now we probably are not on track for hyperinflation. I'm not saying that, but like, I mean, there, there is also a macro question of maybe this inflation issue is to be taken seriously and maybe it can be reconciled with this micro view, right? So I'm just putting this out there because I feel in the political space, um, that kind of does matter. Like, how, how do you bring this together? Like if one person says, oh, inflation doesn't matter. And the, the, the next person says like, oh no, we have to do all these uh, micro things to fight inflation. Then suddenly we have a contradiction that we could maybe avoid because there is maybe some minimum denominator that everybody can share. Um, this is my first point. My second point is just to, stress this, again, I mentioned this during my presentation, um, but there is a, a bit, right, the Emergency Price Stabilization Act um, that was introduced by Congressman Bauman that unfortunately was introduced like one day before, I mean, great that the IRA is there, but it was like the timing was horrible, so it didn't get any pickup. Yeah, people in the room who know so much more about congressional politics than I do, but maybe just putting this out there that there is a bill that I think captures a lot of the things that we have been talking about, so we might want to relate this in one way or another. Yeah, thank you. I want to just pick up on this. Uh, to be honest, I've been quite uncomfortable with this micro-macro distinction. I think it's out of place in the kind of discussion we've been having. Uh, to me, it seems like most of the contributions in the last two days are really in a structuralist tradition, which uh, recognizes sectoral claims, but basically sees inflation as a conflict over income distribution. You know, as as uh, 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 was has been pointed out. So I, I don't think we should get caught in this micro macro stuff. That's that's frankly too mainstream, and the development literature went beyond that a long time ago. So I don't think we should be you know trying to pigeonhole that, saying well this is a micro problem and we can deal it in a micro way. That's a macro problem. I think we're looking at it in terms of struggle over income shares and the way in which both sectors and classes respond to that and unpaid workers and others all respond to that so i i i'm not very comfortable with you know posing it in this macro versus micro thing at all just just a stray thought on this one thank you oh jamie galbraith yeah thank you uh i I also want to intervene very much on the same theme that's just been mentioned to say that there should be no, there's really no daylight between uh, team transitory and team structure or team Weber. 
uh, in the sense that the issue here is the source of the problems that we've been having. Uh, any particular problem uh, may resolve or, or, or essentially uh, stabilize after a period of time. That doesn't mean that you won't face new ones fairly soon. Uh, and in that connection, uh, and sort of dealing about to deal with larger structural issues. I'd just like to say a few things that have not been discussed uh, in the last couple of days uh, and uh, that I think should be discussed. Uh, they've been really quite, uh, really maybe even a little dangerous even to raise them in the last year or so, but I'd like to be on record as having done so. Uh, and the, the first is that uh, to reduce the risk of of uh, further structural problems, the United States needs peace with China. Uh, it, and for that, there needs to be a political solution of the Taiwan question on terms that are acceptable uh, to China. Uh, if you want consumer goods, they come from China. If you want rare earths, they come from China. If you want a semiconductor industry and notwithstanding uh, what has just been done, half the world market for semiconductors is in China. Uh, and the revenue of American semiconductor firms depend on that market. And that's not my, me speaking, that's the United States White House of the Biden administration speaking in 2021. By a very similar token, Europe needs peace with Russia. Uh, and that means facing the realities of the balance of power on the European continent, uh, whether you like them or not. Uh, what is that balance? I think we'll find out soon enough, but the one thing we can take as a hint is the fact, I think it's already clear, that the strategy of trying to influence Russian policy with sanctions is a colossal failure. It has essentially no effect, and the effect that it has had on the Russian economy is meant to strengthen it, not to weaken it. So we need to bear in mind that uh, a great deal of the premises on which our policy has been based have already been shown uh, to be false. Um, and the third point is, multipolarity is a coming thing. Uh, that does not mean that the dollar will lose its position as a major world currency, but it will and is losing its position as the only major world currency. And that means a reduction in the uh, global strength of the U.S. financial sector and a reduction in the purposes of the U.S. military. Uh, there are advantages to this. Uh, if we reduce the financial sector to something closer to the role that it played between the 40s and the 70s, a much smaller role in our economy than the world economy, if we reduce the military sector and achieve a lasting peace uh, in a serious way, then we'll have resources, material resources, human resources, that we can use to address the problems that we, the other problems that we have, including social problems, including climate change, other things that we've been discussing. If we don't do those things, then the resources that we need to mobilize for our purposes will continue to compete with the resources being absorbed by the financial sector and the military sector. And I do not think it's possible to resolve that uh, in a way uh, that is uh, going to be satisfactory uh, to the future social progress, even the social stability of the country. So uh, thanks for hearing me out on those questions. Who's next? Who wants to speak? Everybody had enough? Oh, Josh, okay. I mean, just a couple things in the two separate buckets of like what is to be done bureaucratically with these papers over the next whatever six months or the debate generally. Um, the event, the potential event sounds like a great idea. When I go back next week to my place, we'll talk about it. We'll be in touch. Um, I think that could be great. I think, you know, Bob's point on DC attention spans is totally correct. So there probably want to be some strategic honing of the presentations to make them tighter with a pretty splashy policy point. The papers don't have to change, obviously, but just the way you would talk about them to a room full of um, slightly less academic people um, would be important. Um, I think two other things, though. One, you know, Bob made the joke about the book, and it's going to take too long, and that's that's true. That should not be the only thing, but I don't think it should be underestimated how important it is going to be to keep talking about this episode, even if nine months from now inflation is at 3% and no one cares anymore. How we interpret what happened is going to be super key, because the reason why 
the other side had the field to themselves to say, we have inflation, ergo, we have overheated the economy. It was because people think that's what happened in the late 1970s, and there was much more then than now, but even then, it was a very complete way to story. So, like, you know, how this is, how this episode is seen historically going forward is going to be really key. And then I would just say events are, are great. What is also really great is just a steady drumbeat of timely material. So anyone who's ever been tempted to, you know, are blogs even still a thing? I still write them, but they might not be a thing. Um, but social media, but just like every hook you get of data that comes out one way or the other, um, that is as good as events in a lot of ways. Just reporters need content. They can't wait six months between events. And so if you give them any bit of content that is more intelligent than the other content out there, it's a win for... Um, so all that I think is really key. And then just, um, I'm really struck by like, what is the appropriate macro framework in the face of big sectoral shocks? I think that is a really key question. Um, I would say, I do think my eyes have been opened a lot. Um, cause I was, I'm a little bit like Jerry, like I, two years ago, I'd have been like macro explains the world. Um, and I do think there is a case for like a big part of inflation control going forward should be utterly separate from the Fed and it really should just be shock avoidance. It should be like, you know, in, in the IIJA, it's the bipartisan infrastructure bill that passed this year. There's, there's some good stuff in it. Here's a really good thing about like a body in the government that's going to be set up to do supply chain monitoring and provide information to firms. Um, it's a public good. Private firms don't have the incentive to do it or share their information. But it, you can imagine that sort of a, another body that looks for supply chain bottlenecks, monitors oil markets, you know, just does a bunch of things to try to see the shocks coming. Um, I think once the shock is here, then I am on sort of the transitory. It's mostly about patience. And I think the way we can actually make that patience happen and not be a political disaster is related to Kate's point about we really do need to start communicating better with normal people about what inflation is and is not. It is overwhelmingly a distributional event, as people have said. I, I wrote something earlier this year and basically you know, making the obvious case that a recession would be worse than the inflation we're having now. And it's amazing how backwards reporters have it. They think recession is totally distributional. 5% of people lose their jobs. Everyone else is fine. It's a distributional problem. Inflation, that hits everyone. And that is exactly the opposite of what how it really works. And um, I would say, um, Gregor, if he's still in the room, um, when, when your paper is ready, uh, I'd be happy to consult, tell you to someone else to consult. Like, I think that is just such a good way to explain to people that one person's cost is another person's income. Like you have cracked the dollar, like every foot of the way there. And I say that to reporters and they're just sort of like, that sounds right, but I don't believe it. Um, and I just do think like that, that detailed level of tracking would be unbelievably useful. Um, so that's it. Thank you. Any... It, it's just that I had a second hand to Josh's point. The, from my perspective, this whole thing from Larry Summers in particular was feeling he had been ignored that the rest of us cared about equity and the benefits of full employment. This was his one chance, aha, you ignored me, inflation stayed low, people got jobs, the Hispanic unemployment rate equaled the white unemployment rate. All of that was good, but you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. There's good inflation, this can't be good. So he finally got his come up and how quickly seized on this is wokeism, and this is the result of worrying about equity and all of that kind of stuff. Josh's point, I think, is so key. Coming out of this, how this spell is going to be very important. If it gets sold that the Fed raised interest, it was heroic, it got inflation or control. So, or is it going to be prices are falling very quickly right now for everything that had a chip in it? So as much press has been making hay with inflation. I've been very disappointed. It's Christmas time. If you want to buy a television, the price of televisions this year are dramatically lower than last year, dramatically lower. The inflation for everything that has a chip is minus. You want a computer for your kid? Cheaper. 
you want a telephone for your kid for Christmas, it's cheaper. All of those things are cheaper. The price is down. No, they want to talk about, oh, Christmas is a lot more expensive this year. So it's really important. Not this. A lot of people here are trying to tell another story. I think it's important to think of the long-term strategy, not just this one episode, but how can we keep the drumbeat going so that there's this space for another academic attack at these sorts of things. Uh, and I still remain sympathetic that what made me nervous about the Fed going into this and the way they quickly switched to this is traditional inflation. The global, the global warming threats are absolutely positively real. The chances that they'll be complicated with a war, let's pray that doesn't happen, but the chances that they could be complicated with just that there are too many hurricanes of severe nature. There are just too many tornadoes that are too severe. That the continued drought that is not only taking away rice from China, but power. This year, they had to choose between do we want electricity for air conditioning or for our factories? And that's real now, and it's going to get exacerbated. And the day is for us because the Colorado River is drying up too. So not only are we worried about our farmers in the California Valley, but do you light up half of the United States? It's real. And so we need to be prepared. We need to be ready. And the global consequences are immense. The Fed's reaction, raising the value of the dollar precipitously in the face of other countries struggling already with these forces, and in their cases, to the extreme because their drought problems are bigger than ours. And we're the cause of the global warming that's creating their droughts. The solidarity, I mean, right now, you're going to have, as this continues, you're going to have European countries and Americans outbidding the rest of the world for food. And that's not global warming in 2035. That's within the next three or four years, we will face this crisis. So, so this lack of unity, this lack of understanding or interconnectedness, it's severe and on food you you can get these other ones under control we can get the production eventually under control but we're going to continue to face these big shocks and food prices and so i think it's really incumbent upon us to have better strategies to prevent what we saw in the options markets to drive up the price of food in the face of all of this. There are a whole set of authorities that need to be in place that can be implemented right away that say, no trading. If you're not actually buying this oat to make oatmeal, get out. You can't do it. We're, we're, we're going to come for you if you are just some idle person trying to make money off of this shortage of oats. Not going to happen. So I think we need. I need, I think we need, we need the postmortem to reinforce the correct narrative of how to interpret this, but a postmortem of continuing the scholarship so that we, we've laid the foundation and it doesn't strike people as weird when we say we want price controls, just like we had in World War II, because when the market's not the way to allocate this. And for the globe for global solidarity, it's not the way. It's not the way forward. We can't can't settle food shortages with price. Thanks a lot. I mean, it has been fantastic two days, and I have learned a lot, and it has been very, very motivating. So I would like to just follow up this uh, point perspective. I feel that you know, it is natural to focus on the U.S. case, and this is about mostly U.S. inflation issues. But I, I feel that we need a bit more global perspective to be able to have a bit 
better understanding about global connections as partially, uh, you know, Bill and Jayati suggested in, in, in their presentations. In that sense, I feel to have a better understanding of the implications of the U.S. Policies to target, you know, these problems uh, for developing countries and for other countries. What are the interlinkages? What are possible, you know, causal effects or you know, feedback effects? In that sense, uh, you know, we started to uh, brainstorming with Jayate about the possible extension of this, uh, you know, project to extend the inflation issue on developing countries. And that will be a sort of extension of this. And I feel we need that kind of also uh, perspective to develop and then maybe to move forward. Yeah. I uh, wanna echo Hassan that this has really been fabulous too. I, I and a lot out of this event. Um, I think we're all, you know, committed and understanding it, but these are really kind of two different activities in a lot of ways. And, uh, you know, on the changing side, an event in DC would be great. And I think, you know, one possible way of approaching that is something aimed specifically at congressional staff people, because, you know, Josh and Kate know this world much better than me. But my impression is there's actually, if you get down, you know, to the staffers, there's actually a lot more openness to a broader range of perspective than you might, you know, you might think. And and it's batteries go. You know, in, in that setting, it's important to emphasize what we agree about, but when we're interested in you know improving our understanding, because I think we would all say that a lot we don't understand about inflation, certainly I would say that for myself. You know, we need to be honest about the fact that we don't agree on a lot of things and actually a lot of productive conversations are the ones where we and So I I thought uh, as well as framing in terms of, you know, the, the transitory versus sort of structural kind of vision is, is a helpful one. And I think we actually are maybe in different places. I'm probably equipped to, to Josh on that one, perhaps. Um, but, uh, I think, I think one important dimension of that, that it would be useful to sort of foreground in future conversations. Vision of the future we have is one perhaps intensifying climate shocks, disruption, the Mississippi River. Whether we still on some level believe the promise of the Green New Deal, that there's the potential for a world of climate abundance where it's cheaper, as Bob says, and more broadly, the response of the climate crisis is one that leads to a much, you know, higher level of material life for, 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 for most people. So I think we should just be conscious of the fact that we're not, you know, not all in the same place on those. And when you're talking to media or congressional staff, you emphasize, you know, Larry Summers is wrong, raising interest, just making everything worse. But in this sort of space, I think we should really try to actually highlight and foreground the points where we don't, don't disagree. Actually, I'm not sure if I have a lot to contribute about what is to be done, but to make a few uh, comments on what has already been said. Um, I want to remind us of, I, I hear it from Carol Heim, maybe many others, but this basal level between micro and macro is important here. So uh, the second, maybe it's of a, what sector, so the structuralist uh, version is, is important to keep in mind in these types of inflations. And that can help to help the macro perspective to to um, think about um, inflation and and consequences of these shocks. Um, I wanted to um, second what you were saying, Josh, about if inflation were to uh, vanish tomorrow, that doesn't mean that the insights we have from here, sh uh, you know, are just for the for history. In fact. Even if there are, you know, shocks, also about the shocks that a transition towards an economy that would be mitigating some of these environmental degradations, or you know, or or live with them, uh, you know, that also will keep introducing shocks, and uh, that may get even worse as uh, systems. You know, what if? percent of the economy and the fossil economy is 
and you don't have those economies from either, but you still have to maintain both of them. So I think there is a pretty uh, difficult future ahead of us in any case that requires understanding sectoral issues. And um, I mean, I, I, uh, from how I understand Isabella's argument, part of it is that, you know, when you're at the point you need to be patient, that's really not good. You, you can try to be proactive, so you never have to be there. And so these policy proposals that, that, that you raised, I think, are very important, not only for now, but also for all these other things that are coming in the future. So to echo what was said again. You know, just a, and just a word of caution, which is uh, using this word shock. You know, if you take the oil shocks of the 70s, why did we have oil shocks? We had oil shocks because the sisters were paying, getting, were getting oil, the sort of royalties from oil, which went to the countries which had the oil reserves, was peanuts. And because it was peanuts, energy use in the Western economies went up hugely. So when formed, and there was a redistribution of income to a certain extent, you had a situation that was a shock, but a shock to whom? It was a shock to people who got used within the monopolistic world to extremely low oil prices. So just as much as we talk about conflict models, which looks at capital and labor, there's also a conflict between the commodity producers of the world and or the plant producers that is what dominant consumers or, or influences globally. So I, I, I do think that uh, that should be kept in mind because I mean, if you have deflation in the world, you're always going to have a reserve army of labor which is cheap, which makes it impossible for you to actually ensure that wages in the, in the industrialized economies move faster because that's where you're going to get commodities from. So I, I think about this problem of, of, of the world system, that we need to think about ways of dealing with inflation in which it's not that we not only because in the advanced economies, but we protect commodity producers, ensuring, of course, workers in the informal economies. It's just a word of caution when we formulate our proposals. I'm going to be putting myself on the list twice, but I just wanted to stress this national point. I actually think that there is a strong relationship between what we are doing in the core, what is happening in the periphery that came out of in your presentation, right? Like we only rely on hiking interest rates in countries, and it's probably going to be the worst outcome for the poor countries. If we were to come up with an international solution, which I know sounds utopian in 2022, but still, I mean, let's face it, if we had an international stabilization mechanism for food and fuel prices, then we would probably not be talking food crisis in the global south, we would not be talking inflation in the global north, right? So in many cases, I think there is a total like, zero-sum game situation. In this case, I think there's actually um, a lot of space <laughs> for win-win solution that needs to be articulated in that global um, kind of vision. So yes, this is so important, I think it kind of maybe wasn't stressed enough throughout this conference. So if we move forward, I think it would be to bring this into whatever kind of framing. Um, sorry, I, I have to share this very quickly. But on the question of China, I think there's also one connection that I never talk about, which is the whole chips war thing. Will also actually affect agricultural production in China because they have by now integrated a lot of AI in their agricultural production, which is trying to make use of much, much less fertile land in China, feeding many, many, many more people than in the US. So if you now no longer export these chips, you actually also kind of create possibly not so long down the line another pressure on food supply in, in the most pop, I mean, the most populous countries in the world. So just to say, I mean, underscore this point of interconnectedness, where even like seemingly basic sectors like agriculture end up being connected with super high-tech stuff like computer chips. On the question of whether to have some sort of application or not, I think I agree that it's good to have a record. I personally am quite skeptical. Of, I know you had like the most successful at volume with the financial financialization book that, um, that I am aware of, but 
generally edited volumes sometimes tend to be a space where the individual papers kind of disappear because they are not like so easily accessible individually online. So I think one thing that we might want to think about is also that a special issue of a journal, which might make the individual papers more accessible. It might also have a little bit more weight in the very skewed kind of economics <laughs> discipline that find ourselves. And this is just a thought on, on this question. One point on the financial section, uh, the World Economy book. I think we have to get great to figure out where the rights went. If it was so successful, I have, I have no idea. So, Gregor, uh, I just pick up on uh, uh, Josh Mason's point. And yeah, I, I, I should also say just what the joy is to see so many of our former students here, including Josh Mason, and having flourished on their own and seeing them make such great contributions. So the point I'll make is to say, uh, I'm definitely on the side of advancing the Green New Deal as a or framework for an alternative as, rather than coming a disaster scenario that Bob Kuttner is describing for us. And, and when I say Green New Deal, I mean a global Green New Deal, uh, because uh, when we think about uh, transforming energy systems, transforming agricultural systems. Um, not the, the, the primary beneficiaries are not just in the advanced economy, but in the developing economies. And it's too bad Lance and Decom couldn't make it today online because actually I've been doing some stuff about green economy, even in Burundi. So I think it, it's, it, you know, it is a really uh, robust, dynamic framework to think about transformation. And it's interesting that the uh, the bill that actually did pass Congress, which is called the Inflation Reduction Act, is primarily a climate bill. It's nowhere close to being an adequate climate bill, but it does get at recognizing, you know, a way forward in terms of an alternative set of structural changes. Is that, is anyone else? Are we done? So. Okay, so I guess I've been tasked with, with the closing. Um, uh, not that I'm a pitcher or anything, but um, uh, so yes, thank you to everybody. These were wonderful uh, papers, cool conversation, discussion. Of course, we want to thank Nicole Dunham and Kim Weinstein for all the amazing work. And so just so you can get a bit more of a taste of that, uh, they were a, um, a reception downstairs with food and drink. So enjoy that and um, safe travels for traveling. And uh, we may see some of you later. So um, thank you very much. <laughs>